for the benefit of the audience, please state your name and some things you love about America. Uh, my name is Bryce F. Lockwood. Uh, I love America, number one, for her freedom. Number two, for the beauty of the country that we live in. Number three, for the marvelous people that live here. Not all of us are perfect, but it's a great country. I've been around the world. I just love the United States of America, especially the Midwest. What are some things about America that might frustrate you? Uh, probably the political system. Uh, people that really should not be in office that get elected because they have a popular name. Then when money comes into the program, lobbyists and so forth, they forget why they were elected and do what the lobbyists pay them for. Let's talk about the USS Liberty. What type of ship was it? When did it go into service? And what type of missions did it conduct? The USS Liberty was a World War II Victory Class cargo ship. She was originally commissioned as the SS Simmons Victory. Uh, she saw service at the tail end of World War II. She was actually launched in May of 1945, pretty well towards the tail end of, of the war. Uh, she was produced by a subsidiary of the Kaiser Motor Car Company. Most folks know what happened to Kaiser Motor Car Company. But uh, <clears throat> at the time, ships were in, in very heavy need for transferring supplies both to our allies and to our American troops overseas. The original uh, Liberty class ship was much smaller. Uh, the Nazis were knocking out a lot of them. And the head of the Kaiser Motor Car Company said, I can produce those at the rate of one a day. Well, that seemed like an impossible task. But he did manage towards the tail end of the war to do just exactly that. We could produce them faster than the Nazis and the uh, Japanese could sink them. Uh, SS Simmons victory shortly after World War II was taken out of service and mothballed. During the Korean War, she was brought back into active service, recommissioned, hauled ammunition to the troops in Korea, then placed back in mothballs. And in 1964, as America was starting to produce a fleet of so-called spy ships, this hull was one of the best that was available in the mothball fleet. Mm -hmm. She was brought out of mothballs, spruced up, equipped with the absolute latest in electronics intelligence gathering, including a UNIVAC 500 mobile a computer, which at that time was the largest mobile computer in the world. You could probably do that much with a watch these days, but back then it was pretty hot, skinny stuff. Um, Liberty's normal cruise was up and down the west coast of Africa. Uh, country, several countries in sub-Saharan Africa had just won their independence from colonies such as Spain, Portugal, England, and France. Mm -hmm. There was a heavy Soviet influence in these countries that had newly found freedoms and a heavy Cuban influence. And the United States wanted to keep track of what was transpiring between the Russians and the Cubans and these newly found countries. That was Liberty's primary cruise. Her port away from port was in Abidjan, Ivory Coast and she cruised up and down the west coast of Africa until 1967. In 19, summer of 1967, war appeared to be imminent between Israel and the United Arab Republic, which at that time consisted of uh, Libya, Egypt, Jordan, and Syria. America wanted to keep track of impending hostilities I perhaps should mention here that prior to the outbreak of hostilities, there was a group of four F-4 Phantom photo reconnaissance planes, which were shipped to Torrejon Air Force Base in Spain. Uh, American markings were all obliterated. The pilots were given neutral identification and neutral uniforms. And these planes overflew the United Arab Republic taking photographs 
a capability which the Israelis did not have at that time. Of course, I did not find out about this until well after the Six Days War, but <clears throat> that information was given to the Israelis, so when hostilities did break out on June the 5th of 1967, the Israelis knew where every foreign piece of artillery was, every foreign tank was, every foreign aircraft, where they were riveted, where they were based. When the Israelis initiated hostilities on June the 5th, they were able to neutralize the United Arab Republic Air Force within just a very, very short period of time. Um, I had actually been on a mission in Rota, Spain with VQ-2 uh, Airborne Naval Reconnaissance Unit. We were flying uh, missions over the North Sea, uh, Russian North Sea Fleet summer exercises which were conducted between Iceland and, and uh, Scotland. Uh, that problem dried up. We didn't realize it at the time, but in actuality, the Soviets were running out of money. And the bottom line is, is they didn't have the cash to keep their fleet at sea and equip them for the proper training. So that mission cut short. I was sent back to uh, Rota, Spain, and figured that I was headed back home. I had uh, two young Marine sergeants that worked for me. We were all Russian linguists. Um, they tried to get me to go into town with them, and I was a happily married man, wasn't interested in going to town getting drunk and fooling around. So uh, I just had a nice quiet evening and went to bed, and about two o'clock in the morning comes a bang, bang, bang on the door to my room. I figured it was these two young buck sergeants that worked for me, half drunk and trying to give the old sarge a hard time. And I said, get out of here, leave me alone, and another bang, bang, bang on the door, and uh, I jumped out of the rack, opened the door, and there was a messenger from the Navy Officer of the Day's shack, and he said, Sergeant Lockwood? I said, yes. He said, I have a message here from Joint Chiefs of Staff. said, you are to join the USS Liberty at 0600 hours. Better get up and pack your sea bag. So I, uh, the next morning, bright and early, I'm on the dock looking at this super high class spy ship. There were two other Marines there, Sergeant Jack Reaper and Corporal Eddie Remar, they were both Arabic linguists, sent over to Rota from 2nd Radio Company in Camp Lejeune, North Carolina, and three civilians. Uh, there was a Mr. Wilson, I forgot his first name. There was a Don Blaylock and Al Blue, which were all Arabic linguists. If there were any Hebrew linguists aboard Liberty, I was not aware of it. In fact, as we were en route to our uh, station, which was off the Sinai Peninsula, uh, just, I, I forget the exact date, but I think it was probably on the 3rd or the 4th of June, when the senior research officer aboard Liberty's Lieutenant Commander David Lewis uh, called all of us senior linguists together and told us what we were going to be doing. We were to search all the frequencies for voice activity. Uh, my primary responsibility was Soviet activity in Egypt. There was a group of five Soviet Tu-95s stationed at Alexandria, Egypt. The Soviets had told the world that they had given these planes to the Egyptians and that was pretty far from the truth. They were all Soviet troops manning them, Soviet pilots manning them, Soviet troops guarding them, wearing United Arab Republic uniforms. They would leave Alexandria, fly reconnaissance missions over our U.S. 6th Fleet there in the Mediterranean, and uh, return to Alexandria. And that was my primary mission, and the Russian linguists that were aboard her was to nail down the Soviet activity as far as voice was concerned. We were also interested in any Arabic transmissions, United Arab Republic. We were told that if we picked up a target which was identified as Israeli, Hebrew language, we were to identify it and drop it. We were not targeted against the Israelis. 
on June the 8th of 1967, early in the morning, we were overflown several times by clearly marked Israeli aircraft. I don't recall the exact number, but I think it was about eight overflights by the Israelis. Some of those flights were so low we could see the features of the pilots, so we'd wave to the pilots, the pilots way back. Indeed, a lot of our troops that were off duty were laid out on the deck in lounge chairs catching some rays. Uh, excuse me, that's something that Arabs don't do. They're a lot wiser than we were back then, I should say, perhaps. On the morning of June the 8th, I had had the mid-watch that night, got off duty, I believe at 06 or 0700, I forgot exactly, but uh, went and got a meal, and uh, I had very limited uniforms, so I went to the small s store there on the ship and picked up some underwear that I didn't have with me, and I was at my bunk. Um, we, we had had a drill GQ at roughly at noon on the 8th of June. That lasted probably close to an hour at the dr drill GQ. The captain, Captain McGonigal, came on the address system aboard the ship, the 1MC address system, and told us some things he would like to see us improve. Reminded us that we were very close to a active war zone and reminded us to stay vigilant. Uh, I had gone back to small stores after we secured from the drill GQ and purchased some clean underclothes. It was at my rack in the birthing compartment, the after part of the ship stamping my name in my new t-shirts when there were some very loud explosions. I had never been under hostile fire before, but I knew immediately that this was no accident. Dropped what I was doing and headed for my GQ station. The general quarters alarm sounded. It was rather ironic that uh, the wrong alarm was sounded. Uh, I don't recall just exactly wrong. One was for attack, one was for chemical attack, and I think the other one was for atomic attack. I don't recall exactly now, but they, each one of those alarms had a different sound, and the wrong alarm was sounded, but it didn't make any difference. <laughs> it's pretty obvious we were under attack. My drill GQ, or my GQ station was below decks in the uh, secure spaces where we had manual morse intercept positions and uh, linguist intercept positions. We were in what was called the cohort spaces where we put all the messages together and um, assigned notations to it so they could be kept track of and forwarded that material onto the National Security Agency for distribution to the consumer. Um, my position was in a, a transcription room where we took voice tapes that we had intercepted and transcribed them and sent the translated material back on to Washington. We had stacks of coding manuals and stacks of magnetic tape that we had collected. We could hear the whole ship would ring as these shells would strike it. The Israelis were using um, rockets and 40 millimeter cannon fire. Every time one of those shells would strike the ship, it was like you were on the inside of a large steel cylinder with someone beating on it with a sledgehammer. Just the whole ship would ring. I remember hearing uh, Chief Melvin Smith, he was a senior enlisted for our division, said, well, I guess we better start emergency destruction. Uh, that was something we didn't want to hear, but we had these uh, large canvas ditching bags, uh, oh, probably five feet in length. Uh, there was a tie around the neck of the sack. There were brass ferrules uh, around it, lead weight in the bottom. The idea was to pack all of our classified information in those bags take them topside and pitch them over the side before very much period of time at all whatsoever. Any information that was in there would be unusable. 
uh, emergency destruction is something in our trade that you didn't want to hear. Years of activity of breaking codes and putting code manuals together and collecting information and processing it. And the machines that we use and so forth all had to be destroyed. Heartbreaking. Uh, we had finished that. I was sitting <clears throat> on a plotting table there in the cord spaces. I finished up a cup of coffee and the captain came on the uh, address system, the 1MC address system, and said, Brace yourselves, torpedo attack starboard side. I had a longtime friend of mine, Ronnie Campbell, that was there in the office, and he said, Well, they've hit us with everything else. Well, can they hit us with? Ronnie took a piece of paper and put it in his mill, his typewriter, and said, you fellas can do what you want. He said, I'm going to write a letter home. And he started typing, Dear Eileen, you won't believe what's happening to, to us. Uh, assistant Division Officer Lieutenant Bennett stuck his head in the door, and he said, Sergeant Lockwood, you come here a minute, please. I uh, got up and stepped out into the passageway. Um, I, w there were, the two other Marines were sitting at the end of Ronnie Campbell's desk. They both had helmets. We didn't have enough helmets to go around, but they were both wearing helmets. And uh, Corporal Raymire was looking down. Sergeant Raper looked up at me and had kind of a nervous grin on his face, and I winked at him and went out, out into the passageway. Lieutenant Bennett and Commander Lewis had just got me in a conversation about these ditching bags. It's a Marine's job to get shot at. And they were supposed to be carried topside, pitched over the side where shooting was going on. Uh, when suddenly there was a blinding flash of flame, terrible, ear-rending noise. I fell to the deck, um, apparently semi-conscious. I thought life was over. The first thought that came through my mind, I said, well, Lord, I guess I'm coming home at least... Lois and the kids are taken care of, Lois and my wife, my three children. I felt something cold and I looked down and water was gushing in. I thought, oh my God, we're in trouble. I struggled on my feet and I heard a sailor moaning behind me and I didn't find out until considerably later either who it was or what the circumstances were. The man's name was Joe Lentini. Joe had taken a piece of shrapnel from a rocket, apparently, that had penetrated the entire ship and struck him in the thigh and was bleeding rather profusely in his thigh. And he had sat down on the deck and leaned up against the ladder way that was the escape to the next deck above, our only means of escape out of the, those secure spaces, and was putting a tourniquet on that wound when the torpedo struck. We had sheet steel bulkheads that separated the various operation spaces, and the blast from that torpedo had just mushroomed that sheet steel bulkhead out. Joe had his left leg propped up while he was putting that tourniquet on his thigh, and that sheet steel bulkhead just trashed his left leg, just made toothpicks out of his femur bone, and it tangled him up in the wreckage. Um, water was coming up pretty quickly. I try to get my arms under his armpits and pull him free, but he was wedged in there pretty tightly. I said, come on, you got to help me. I can't do it by myself. And water was coming up quite rapidly by then. Uh, it was almost up to his neck. And I said, come on, get your legs under you and push. I can't do it by myself. Come on, push, push. And I saw him kind of struggling around. I didn't realize his left leg was just useless. But he got his right leg under him and pushed just enough to where I could pull him free. But I still didn't realize that his left leg was still tied up in that wreckage. By that time, the water was within about 18 inches, foot and a half of the overhead. And I said, here, get a hold of these pipes up here. There was a bunch of uh, pipes that had cabling in them, power cables and antenna cables and so forth. I got one hand around that, and about that time I saw this... Uh, body floating towards the torpedo hole, and I just reached down, got her arm around it, and held his head above water. There was uh, quite a bit of panic. Uh, the sailors were crowding around that one narrow 
ladder leading to the deck above and a lot of shouting and hollering and uh, I just shouted out as loud as I could, knock it off if y'all don't settle down, none of us will get out of here alive. I heard uh, Lieutenant Bennett, the assistant division officer, was apparently at the top of that ladder way. We had a large hatch that was watertight that was placed down and there were heavy dogs, there were bolts with a large nut on it that were screwed down tightly. And in the center of that hatch was a smaller scuttle hole with a release, was a circular wheel that you could release that and open it up. And he said, this Lieutenant Bennett opened this hatch. Apparently I passed out because I don't remember anything for a period of time. When I, the next thing that I realized was everyone was gone except me and this sailor that I was trying to keep his head above water. I uh, started towards the ladder way and dropped to him and as the ship was rolling, there was a huge hole in the side of the ship from the torpedo. It was about roughly 30 by 40 some feet in diameter. Um, as the ship would roll with a natural wave of the sea, water was gushing in and then gushing back out. And this sailor's headed towards that hole, so I went back and got him, got him back up to the ladder way, got about halfway up the ladder way, and um, the torpedo had ruptured a fuel bunker. And this bunker fuel that operates the boilers aboard ship was a real heavy grade of oil, stinks awful. That oil was everywhere. We didn't have any light, couldn't see anything. The only light, I didn't actually realized until much later the only light that we had was what was coming through the torpedo hole underwater. I got about halfway up the ladder way and a piece of the torpedo had struck the railing to this ladder way and squeezed it in. There was only about an eight inch space to get up past there. It was covered with oil and seawater and I slipped and dropped this sailor again. Went back, got him again, so I got to watch out for that place in a railing, got up to the top of the ladder way and the hatch was sealed shut. And uh, I'm trying to hold the sailor above water with one hand and pounding on the hatch with the other. And There was a gentleman uh, by the name of Bobby Schnell that had opened the scuttle hole and saw this Marine down there and beat open the uh, bolts that were holding it down had opened it up, and I didn't realize until much later that that was actually Bobby Schnell who had done that. And there was another sailor there by the name of Phil Turney. Uh, Phil was part of the damage control. He didn't have legal access to our spaces, but the captain had set him down there to take a look at the damage and see how badly the ship was hurt, whether or not she's going to sink nearly immediately or what. Uh, Phil told me, he said, you, the captain has said to prepare to abandon ship. He said, you need to get on a life vest and put one on him. There was a large bin there that had life vests in it. He said, you don't need to inflate it now. He said, you could pull this cord and that will automatically inflate. But he said, uh, they're taking the heavy casualties back to the mess area. They had taken mattresses from the after birthing compartment and put them on the tables in the mess decks area and were treating the most severely wounded. Well, I tried to pick this man up and put him over my shoulder and carry him back there and I didn't realize I was weak and dropped him, picked him up again, dropped him again. It's kind of ironic, many years later, his name was Dave McFagan and um, I was sitting in his kitchen table over morning breakfast and Dave said rather ironic, he said, I wouldn't be hurting nearly as bad if you would have dropped me so many times. <laughs> I, I hadn't realized it, but uh, Dave had been topside during the air attack. And there had been an explosion pretty close to him and slammed him back into a steel bulkhead and they don't give very much with human flesh. And he had injured some vertebrates. Well, his GQ station is down below he had go, oh, got to get to my GQ station. Gets down there to his GQ station and he's sitting on that ladder way holding his head in his hands just in pain 
when they slammed the hatch shut and bolted it down, then the torpedo struck and slammed him back into that ladder way and broke some more vertebrates in his neck. And Dave is pretty well confined to a wheelchair now. Um, they tell me that somewhere along the line, I had taken one man out and gone back down. Um, Chief White, Stan White, was a senior enlisted aboard the ship, Navy Senior Chief CT. He said that I brought one man out and laid him down and started back down there. And he told me, he said, Sarge, you can't go back down there. And he said, I just gave him a blank look and went back down. But I don't remember any of that. But there was another sailor there, Bobby Schnell. Bobby had been a weightlifter, pretty good shape. Uh, Bobby picked... Uh, Mr. McFagan up and carried him back to sick bay and I thought, man, I'm thirsty. I got to get something to drink. And there was a scuttlebutt just around the corner in the passageway, a drinking fountain. And the Navy kept that shining. Well, I went back there and reached over to get a drink of water and a black man looked back at me. I thought, God, what's going on here? And then filled it with blood. Apparently I was bleeding profusely out my nose and on my ears. Is that the time that you had the photo taken? Were you, it, it, the uh, explosion was, blackened that, your face and, and that was taken bleeding? the next morning. Okay. Um, I went back to the sick bay area and we we're still under attack and I'm thinking that I think most of us believe that it was Egyptians that were doing this and I'm thinking, good Lord, if I'm going to be taken prisoner of war, shut up in an Egyptian prison for a few years. I want something to read. And uh, <clears throat> the torpedo had destroyed my glasses, but I had a spare pair in my bunk in the after birthing compartment. So I went back to my bunk and got my spare pair of glasses and put them on. And I had a leather New Testament there that one of my friends had given me in language school. I stuck that in my pocket and um, Someone said that seriously wounded need to go to the radio room, which was on the um, port side of the ship. So I went out to the radio room, and they told they were still shooting out there. Rounds were buzzing around. So you better lie down while well, I laid down face up on the deck. And um, I heard this Mayday go out. Firefox, Firefox, this is Rock Star, Rock Star under attack by unidentified surface and naval air units require immediate assistance. Well, as soon as that May Day was acknowledged, the shooting stopped. And I saw some sailors take three inflatable life rafts through the radio room. They were attached to lines to keep them aboard until the wounded were loaded aboard them. I heard a revving of engines and more machine gun fire, and one of those sailors came back through the radio room and said, I don't know what we're going to do now. They had machine gunned the life rafts. The line to one of those life rafts had been severed, and the uh, torpedo boat had picked up that life raft and taken it aboard. Um, I did not realize until the next morning um, we were still at general quarters. There was a quite a lengthy period of silence. And uh, then we heard aircraft approaching, helicopters. You could hear the beat, beat, beat of the helicopter blades. And I didn't know until considerably later, there were two helicopters that came over fully loaded with troops armed with automatic weapons, hand grenades hanging off them. Some of the troops were had their feet out the door, resting on the skids to the helicopter. Um, and apparently about that time they had been recalled because of the acknowledged May Day. Um, they hovered for a while and then left. And uh, we were told that probably everything's going to be all right. And I don't remember exactly the series of events here, but... Sometime after that, we heard more helicopter thump, thump, thump. Um, a helicopter had been sent out f with uh, the U.S. Naval Attaché aboard it. 
And uh, we didn't know, we, we, we thought we were under attack again. Um, the naval attaché dropped a brown paper back on the forecastle of the ship. There was blood and gore everywhere up there. We had two gun tubs up in the forecastle of the ship, one on each side, port and starboard, 50 caliber machine gun. There were uh, two sailors that manned those guns. In the first air raid, there was a uh, steel shield that went around there that kept those fellows in heavy seas trying to defend the ship, kept them from being swept overboard in a heavy sea. The rockets had struck that shield and then the gunners. The next morning when I went topside, that whole front part of the ship was red, running with blood. There were human body parts sliding everywhere. The sack that the naval attaché, his name was Ernst Castle, Navy commander. The sack that he dropped on the deck was weighted down with an orange and had his business card in it. Commander Ernst B. Castle, U.S. Navy, U.S. Naval attaché, Tel Aviv, Israel. It landed right next to a severed leg that still had the boot on it. And on the back part of the card, it said, have you casualties? Well, excuse me, it was pretty obvious. Um, someone picked that sack up and carried it to the captain. The captain looked at his card, and I understand that he stuck his head out the door and popped the social finger at the helicopter. Uh, the helicopter left. Um, we were trying to recover. I was taken to the uh, mess decks area. I was uh, trying to do my best to help those that were wounded more seriously than I was. Our executive officer, uh, Commander Armstrong, um, Lieutenant Commander Armstrong, had taken a piece of shrapnel up through his side and uh, was bleeding rather profusely. Well, I had the same blood type as he did, so I got a hold of Dr. Key for our ship surgeon. I said, uh, how about let me give blood for Commander Armstrong? And he shook his head no, and I was a, a little angered. I said, this man's dying, so I can give, I, I can give blood. I gave him blood before, and a Navy chief by the name of Joe Bankert came over and said, Sarge, you've done enough. I said, come with me. He took me over to uh, another part of the mess deck area, and there was a mattress laid out in the deck, and he sat me down, and uh, a friend of mine, Bing Bingham, who'd been a former Marine, came over and brought a, a canteen mug that had coffee in it and apparently had something else in there with it because whatever it was, it knocked me out. Um, the next morning when I woke up, Bing Bingham standing over me again and he said, Sarge, this one's okay. He said, you can drink this. It was another cup of coffee. And I wanted to see the damage. He said, he, Bing told me then that it was the Israelis that had done it. They were using unmarked aircraft, which is a violation of international law. They were jamming our distress frequencies. That's a violation of international law. They machine gun our life rafts. That's a violation of international law. We didn't find out until much later, the Israelis, it was pretty well public knowledge that the Israelis had captured the morning of June 8th, an entire Egyptian brigade, somewhere in excess of 850 individuals. There had been a tacit agreement between the Lyndon Johnson administration and the Israeli government not to attack the Golan Heights. Golan Heights was controlled by Syria. Syria was being supplied by the Soviet Union. Indeed, there were Soviet troops there advising the Syrian troops on Golan Heights. I understood that there was um, an agreement between the Israelis to be very generous toward the Syrian commanding officer of those troops. And on the morning of June the 9th, after Liberty was out of the way, he had ordered his troops to pull back and Israel on June the 9th attacked Golan Heights and easily took it. 
it's rather ironic that just about a year ago, I was giving a lecture at a VFW hall in Olathe, Kansas, to a group of people that were advocating for peace in the Middle East, and there was a Syrian naturalized citizen there. When I related about the Syrian troops being ordered to be pulled back and the commander being paid rather handsomely by the Israelis, this man's arm shot up and he said, my name is Fadi Banyomarja. My uncle was an officer in the Syrian army and what you say is true. The Israeli troops which were guarding the Egyptian prisoners of war were needed for the attack on Golan Heights. On the morning of June the 8th, this entire Egyptian brigade was forced to dig their own graves and then brutally murdered by the Israelis. Many of them had their hands tied behind their backs with barbed wire. Folks, we're talking about a very serious violation of international law here. I think the year was 1986. I picked up a copy of the Springfield, Missouri news leader. Buried on the inside was a tiny article about those Egyptian troops being brutally murdered by the Israelis. The individuals who blew the whistle were two Israeli journalists, one from Israel television and the other from an Israeli newspaper. When we talk about fake news, there is definitely, folks, a need for news people that are interested in digging and finding out the facts. So those Israeli muckrakers, their story made it into the Springfield newspaper. Yes, I think the year was 1986. And it wasn't widely covered or publicized elsewhere? Uh, I understand there was an article in the uh, New York newspaper, uh, but that was also buried on the inside. Uh, I have a copy of the article that I cut out of the Springfield news, news leader. So let me just frame out what you've described thus far. You were 27 years old. You had a wife and three kids. You weren't stationed permanently on the Liberty. You were in road to Spain. So you get, uh, you get some mission orders. You go on the ship. You need some clothes. You're getting familiar with that ship. Was it similar to any other ship that you had been on? Or did you have to learn new passage layouts and general quarters drill, you know? This was my first time aboard ship, period. Okay. Because uh, you're a linguist, <clears throat> so you had served uh, on my, my duty stations prior to that had all been land bases. Okay. Uh, my, uh, pretty much my entire first four years in the Marine Corps spent going to school, so manual Morse code then uh, Army Language School at Presidio Monterey, California for Russian language. That was a year school. Um, then I was sent to Fort Evans in Massachusetts to a uh, communications intelligence school there where we did processing and reporting, how to process and report the information that you have found out. And um, my home base was actually second radio company at Camp Geiger, North Carolina. Uh, in February of 1963, this was about the time the uh, intelligence fleet was being designed and put together. Uh, I was sent with a, a group of some other Marines to Fort Meade, Maryland. That's we, the NSA? Yes, National Security Agency, right. <clears throat> we were studying a sub-Saharan African problem in that was these countries which I'd mentioned earlier had just won their independence. Uh, I, th I think the plan was to uh, parachute us into the Congo and set up a listening post in the Congo. Apparently that never materialized because within just a matter of a few weeks of uh, finishing our uh, indoctrination at NAS NSA headquarters and returning back to Camp Geiger, we were all split up. Our uh, lieutenant in charge was sent to Vietnam. I got orders to uh, Edsel, Scotland. I was two years in Edsel, Scotland then transferred to uh, Karamasel, Turkey. Uh, I was at Karamasel for about seven or eight months. These are all listening stations? Yes, yes. 
And uh, then in uh, December of 1965, our entire Marine outfit at Kiramisel, Turkey was transferred to Bremerhaven, Germany. In 1967, I was on temporary duty with these two other Russian linguists to VQ-2, um, the Aerial Reconnaissance Unit in Rota, Spain, and then again transferred for temporary duty aboard the USS Liberty. So you're a Russian linguist. Yes. It's the Cold War. Yes. You're on a naval ship that has been outfitted or re-outfitted with the latest in surveillance technology on the planet. It's NSA equipment on a Navy ship, and you're a Marine. You're helping to accomplish the mission. The mission, they have been sailing up and down the coast of Spain or a coast of Africa for three years, right? It's not like they took a ship from Indonesia coverage and put it over here by Africa. This is a known ship. It sails around. It has these antennas, right? It's a, it's a known known in that area. You don't have any Hebrew li linguists, but you have Arabic linguists, you have Russian linguists, because that's, that's who you're, you're targeting. So even though you're a spy ship in international waters, it's well known that you're a spy ship in international waters and that you're only spying on, on enemies, not allies. That's correct. I should probably inter interject here. Just shortly before the torpedo struck, <clears throat> my relief for my, I was a watch section voice intercept supervisor aboard Liberty. I had uh, three sailors that worked for me. They were Spanish, Portuguese, and French capable linguists. And uh, the two Marines on day watches, I also had the civilian advisor, Al Blue, to my watch section, which were all Arabic linguists. Uh, just shortly before the torpedo struck, my watch section relief named uh, CT-1 Ibrancher by the name of Jim Lupton. His home base was in Karamasal, Turkey, and I had known Jim when we were stationed at Turkey. Uh, Jim was the president of the scuba diving club at Karamasal, and I had made some inquiries about getting scuba qualified while I was there, but it turned out that we were packed up and sent to Bremerhaven, and so it was quite a surprise when I got aboard the ship, and Jim and I became pretty good friends. Uh, just shortly before the torpedo struck, Jim came running into the coordinating spaces where I was and said, hey, Sarge, I got him, I got him. And he still had his earphones around his neck. And I said, you got who, Jim? He said, the Ruskies. And I said, you're kidding me. He said, no, man, plain language. And he went running back into wow. the voice intercept section area when the torpedo struck and killed him. So at the time the torpedo struck the Liberty, the Russians were sending messages in the clear that you guys were hearing. Yes. Where did the torpedo come from? Uh, there were three motor torpedo boats that were using a classic wedge formation. Uh, actually, I did not know they were Israelis until the next day. It was my understanding that all the aircraft, I was below decks throughout the entire attack or inside the ship throughout the entire attack, but it was my understanding from the fellows that were there that they were using unmarked aircraft, but when the torpedo boats attacked, they were flying a Star of David. One of our naval officers that was topside was Jewish. I don't recall his name, but I understand when he saw the Star of David on the torpedo boats, he burst into tears. Captain McGonagall, at this point, what type of injuries has he sustained? Uh, Captain McGonagall had taken a piece of shrapnel in his thigh. He had been bleeding rather profusely, and he had lost quite a bit of blood, but he refused to leave his station. I became pretty good friends with Dr. Richard Kiefer years later, and Dr. Kiefer told me in 2009, he said, I could have and probably should have relieved the captain of his duties. He was occasionally slipping in and out of semi-consciousness, and he probably should have relieved him. Uh, I don't know whether I should say this or not, but one of the other officers told me that Captain McGonagall had said, let's run our ground and abandon ship. The officer that told me that later became, uh, he, he didn't get along just real well with Captain McGonagall. His name was, uh, uh, oh, I'm sorry, I just slipped my mind, but uh, he, the captain pretty well 
ruined his future career. When I eventually got back to my home base in Bremerhaven, my Marine commanding officer decided me to duty NCO, non-commissioned officer, one night. And uh, I had to go check in with the officer of the day. His, his name was Lloyd Painter. He was a Lieutenant JG. He had been an ensign aboard during the attack, but he'd been promoted to Lieutenant JG. And he was the officer of the day. So I go into his office space and there's Mr. Painter sitting in there with his jacket all unbuttoned and his tie loose and his feet propped up on the desk. He says, hey, Sarge, good to see you. Mr. Painter got out of the Navy and went to work, went to work for uh, the Secret Service. Quite some years later, he's part of the presidential advance party in New York City. Mr. Painter is on an elevator car with a fully automatic weapon, and Moshe Dayan gets in the same car. Mr. Painter told me later, he said, I thought about it. <laughs> Moshe Dayan was the Prime Minister of Israel during this period? Uh, he was the head of the Soviet military forces, and we found out later that it was, actually we have a document that was later released under the Freedom of Information Act that it was Moshe Dayan who had ordered the attack on our ship over the objections of both the Prime Minister of Israel and the Foreign right. Thank Minister. You. Thank you for the correction. During this time, LBJ is president. The USS Liberty is part of the Sixth Fleet. It's, there's a lot going on in the Sixth Actually, Fleet. Actually, she was only part of the Sixth Fleet for communication purposes. She was operating independently. And were there any other US ships or US airplanes in the area? It was my understanding sometime later that both the Air Force and the Navy had uh, spy planes overhead and the transmissions between the attacking Israeli pilots and their ground control station were intercepted by both the Naval Reconnaissance Air and the Air Force Reconnaissance Air. I've noticed a lot of parallels between the attacks that were suffered in Benghazi at the Libyan, uh, American Embassy in Libya and its uh, auxiliary units, insofar as calling for help, help being available, but the rank and you know the the hierarchy is is denying it. Is there anything in the in the case of the USS Liberty where United States military personnel could have been brought to bear to help the situation, help alleviate the situation, and were told to stand down? Um. Liberty had requested a destroyer escort, and Com 6 Fleet, I believe that would have been Admiral Bill Martin, told us that you are a clearly marked ship sailing in international waters. Your mission is pretty well known. There's no need for any escort. The nearest ships were some 400 nautical miles away, which was the 6th Fleet. Um, Commander Lewis's wounds were very similar to mine. I was facing the torpedo when it struck, and my glasses protected my eyes. My face was a mess. It was flash burn. Commander Lewis was perpendicular to the torpedo explosion, and um, debris from the explosion went underneath his glasses and sealed his eyes shut. It's rather ironic that he was rather badly wounded and wrapped in bandages and um, winched aboard the rescue helicopter the next morning in a basket. And the Navy guy that winched him aboard couldn't tell which end was which and sat on his face. And Commander Lewis said sometime later, said, how ironic, here I survive a torpedo explosion and die of suffocation with a sailor sitting on my face. <laughs> Uh, we were both aboard the Carrier America, and I was given pretty much free reign of the ship. I happened to be in the passageway outside the optical shop when Commander Lewis's eyes were freed. And uh, he had his back to me, and he was reading an eye chart while a corpsman was telling him what to do. And I stood in the doorway patiently until he finished reading a chart. He turned around and saw me there, and he said, Sarge, how good to see you, and grabbed my hand, just gave me a strong handshake. 
Several years later, we had been invited to the White House under the administration of George Herbert Walker Bush. He was supposed to meet with us. We were there for an anniversary reunion. And um, he snubbed us. Marine One had landed. He got off the helicopter and walked straight into the west wing of the White House and waved to us and ignored us and sent Brett Scowcroft and um, John Sununu, as national, national security advisor and, and foreign advisor, over to work the Liberty crowd. I heard a voice behind me come to find out it was uh, the son of our uh, small store supply officer and the mailman, Spiker was his name. Frank Spiker was standing behind me and when the president walked past us and just waved to us, he said, we just been snookered. I must say here that John Sununu, in my opinion, was fake. He was saying, hi, how are you? Hi, how are you? He could care less. He was thus doing his job. Brett Scowcroft, on the other hand, was rather kindly to us, listened to our stories, was very polite to us. Um, I stepped over under the awning there in the Rose Garden and I saw this gentleman walking towards me in a business suit, and I thought, boy, he looks familiar. So I went over and stood in front of him and held out my hand and said, I'm Bryce Lockwood. And he said, Sarge, how are you? It's good to see you. It was Mr. Lewis. I hadn't seen him for some 30 in years. The Secret Service detail? Or no, he, was, uh, he had uh, spent his time in the Navy and retired as a full commander and uh, was just there for the reunion. So USS Liberty was in no way ambiguously disguised. It, it was clearly marked and had a known area of territorial operation. Absolutely. Uh, the Israelis claimed they mistook us for an Egyptian ship. The El Qasir, which, excuse me, was well identified in James all the world's fighting ships. If you're any kind of a ship, military ship at sea, you must have aboard you a copy of James All the World's Fighting Ships. Right. So obviously, the torpedo boats that attacked us should have had a copy of James All the World's Fighting Ships. And that would give the profile of the ship so that The profile of the ship, right. her armament, everything about her, the shipbuilding company, her propulsion system, and the same for the Egyptian ship Al Qasir. Well, Jane's fighting ship said she was inoperative and waiting to be cut up for scrap. <clears throat> and excuse me while we're on the subject, <clears throat> American ships are painted gray. Home numbers in English lettering and figures highlighted those uh, GTR-5 stands for General Technical Research. That means she is a non-combatant. Number five stood for her the ship of her class. She was a fifth and newest ship of her class, clearly identified. Egyptian ships at that time were painted black with hull markings in gray in Arabic script. Every highway sign in Israel is in Hebrew, Arabic script, and English lettering. Don't tell me the pilots could not tell the difference or the torpedo boats could not tell the difference between Arabic script. Maybe you could claim they were colorblind. It's close enough for plausible deniability, though, to use as an excuse. That was the excuse they used. In the video, Dead in the Water, which was done by BBC Television, there was an interview there with the Israeli admiral, who was the father of the torpedo boat captain that fired the fatal torpedo, and he says, well, they are similar. I, I suppose you could claim that. They were both ships. How did they know to use unmarked planes? How did they? Well, that would not be in my field of endeavor. I wouldn't have any idea, but it's pretty obvious they were trying to cover up what they were doing. That same afternoon that Commander Lewis received his eyesight back again, he was uh, ordered to go to the Admiral's stateroom aboard the USS America, the aircraft carrier. Admiral Geis was the commanding officer for Task Force 6. 
which included the carriers USS America, USS Saratoga, and the um, guided missile cruiser USS Little Rock. Uh, Admiral Geis explained to Mr. Lewis that he had done his best to get aid to us. Uh, aircraft launched both by the USS Saratoga and the USS America. They were recalled by Secretary of Defense Robert McNamara. Joseph Tully, who was skipper of the USS Saratoga, came to our 25th anniversary reunion in Rapid City, South Dakota. Captain Tully said, he was a rather short, gravelly-voiced individual. He says, come here, Marine, I want to talk to you. He said, I understand you got shut in trying to save a sailor. Well, the conversation went on to what had happened. He said, I wanted you to know that we did our best to get aircraft to you. They were recalled. Captain Tully figured it was because there had been some nuclear armaments aboard the aircraft. There had been ready. And uh, they were recalled. Um, the nuclear armaments were taken off. The, sh the aircraft were rearmed with conventional weapons, refueled and relaunched. And Washington was again notified and Secretary McNamara again ordered them recovered. Admiral Geis said, I want to hear that from higher authority. Secretary McNamara said, here's the president. President Johnson came on. I understand the conversation went like this. I don't care if the ship sinks. Get those aircraft back. I will not have my allies embarrassed. Now, excuse me, the Israelis were using unmarked aircraft and we did not know who was attacking us. How did Lyndon Johnson know? And my blood is boiling. Well, LBJ certainly had a lot of conflicts of interest during his presidency. He wanted to be reelected. He needed financing. He had a very close relationship with Israel such that he said, you guys can do this, but don't touch the Golan Heights. When Israel's foreign policy decides to touch the Golan Heights and there's an American spy ship there, we can also talk about the fact that once the Americans knew it on the ship, the British also knew it at the same time. The British have treaties with some of these countries that are getting their land taken. There's a whole quagmire and bee's nest that happens with that. So LBJ, I think, it, just asking those questions about why didn't he take other actions and why did he recall the wings and how, you know, how could he justify scuttling that intelligence, the sailors, the whole thing. But you also have to ask the question, you got this new NSA spy ship out there, it's got all its equipment. We want some of that equipment. If we're a foreign, like a foreign agency, uh, how do you get that equipment? You put the ship under attack, your protocol is to scuttle it, then they can go down and get it later. There's also that aspect, right? Some may remember there was a John Wilson spy case here a number of years ago. John Wilson was a warrant officer in the United States Navy stationed at Fort Meade National Security Agency. At that time, we were, our communications were using code streams two streams of 10 figures that were randomly scrambled. Those were fed into our scramble machines. That was the same system that we used actually in our tactical equipment in Vietnam and the same code streams. John Wilson was passing those code streams lucratively to the Soviets. Well, the code streams were no good to them without the equipment. There are some of us that, looking back, think there's a very good possibility that there was agreement between the Israelis and the Soviets. From the moment that we, the USS Liberty, left Rota, Spain, we had a Soviet destroyer that was shadowing us roughly 1,500 yards off our starboard beam. That Soviet destroyer was on the scene, knew what was going on. The first to offer us aid the morning, the day of the attack, what were they doing there besides shadowing us? We were in relatively shallow water. Had we been sunk, it would have been pretty easy for Soviet divers to go down to the wreckage and retrieve that communications gear. Seven months later, January the 21st, 
1968, USS Pueblo, captured by the North Koreans, same communications gear, now the Soviets have it. The truth of the matter is, without the IBM cards, which were destroyed on a daily basis, but the Soviets would not have known that when they were after that communications gear. So part of the protocol is you scuttle all the uh, communications data that you've collected, but as far as trying to destroy all the equipment, it's pretty ineffective when you're under fire and the ship is sinking. There was a good chance that they could actually recover that equipment and make it useful in a some... A very good chance. Right. A very good chance, yes. I spent 10 days aboard the uh, Carrier America. Uh, actually, on the 9th of June, when I was taken to sick bay aboard the America, the uh, chaplain and a doctor came and checked us out. <clears throat> and the uh, doctor said, you're in pretty good shape. I said, oh, good, I can see the ship. And the chaplain was standing right there. He was a Navy commander. And he said, no, Sarge. He said, you take it easy today. He said, you don't need to be up running around. They uh, gave me a bunk in the sick bay, and uh, I'm sitting on the edge of my bunk, and the, the skipper of the Marine Detachment, uh, Captain L.L. L. Charettes, Lonnie Charettes, came to me with the gunnery sergeant and uh, a young corporal and wanted to know if I needed anything. At the time, I smoked, and I said, I sure would like a clean uniform and some smokes. And he said, you got it. Uh, the only uniform I had on was my utility uniform that I had on. Um, sitting on my bunk in the skivvies, and within an hour, here comes my freshly pressed uniform back to me in a full carton of cigarettes. Um, the corporal was, uh, uh, his name was Michael Newton, heck of a nice guy. And the uh, captain told me, he said, uh, Corporal Newton is going to give you pretty much access to the ship wherever you want to go, except certain areas which are totally off limits. Man, he took me everywhere on this ship. Took me to the air boss's uh, flight tower, watched the planes being launched and recovered, and took me down to the engine room. I wanted to see the engine room, these monstrous boilers and turbines that made the ship operate and just was so fascinated with them. Took me to the uh, aircraft launch center, the monstrous gear that launched these, what, 20-ton aircraft into the air from zero to 180 knots in a matter of a few seconds. And you talk about being fascinated. I was just mind-boggled at how Kindly, these people treated me. The next morning, I'm in the mess decks area, and I'm getting breakfast, and there's a gentleman sitting there in a flight suit. He was uh, the uh, radar operator aboard one of the F-4 Phantoms, and he had mentioned to me that they had launched to come to our aid. Quite some years later, I'm sitting in the parking lot, J.C. Penney's, parking lot, Springfield, Missouri. My wife is in there buying her unmentionables and my cell phone rings. And this voice on the other end said, is this Sergeant Lockwood? And I said, uh, yes. He said, well, you don't know me, but he said, my name is Bill Knutson. In 1967, I was executive officer of VF-33. I was the first plane that was launched to come to your aid. And we have corresponded back and forth several times since then, but um, he later retired a Navy full captain, and he said, to this day, I am angry. Well, when you have a president who would see it as embarrassing to save the lives of U.S. servicemen in order to preserve a relationship and foreign policy with an ally that wasn't treating us like an ally at the time, right? An unprovoked attack, strafing of the, of the lifeboats, wanting that ship obviously to sink because they put 3,000 rounds into it. How many torpedoes? It is my understanding there were five torpedoes that were fired. Thankfully, the Israeli Navy wasn't nearly as competent as their Air Force was. 
in a classic wedge formation or arrowhead formation, there was a John Wayne movie from the Second World War where he was a torpedo boat skipper, and this is the same operation. Mm -hmm. There's a wedge formation, one torpedo boat in the lead, one back to the starboard side, one farther back to the port side. The first one fires their machine guns, tries to keep heads down so they can get in close and fire their torpedoes. They peel off, the second one does the same, they peel off, and then the third one comes in. Well, that would be tor torpedo tubes on each of those torpedo boats. That would be six torpedoes. What happened to the sixth one? It's my opinion that it didn't get out of the torpedo boats. Malfunction. Right. Uh, <clears throat> at one of our reunions, we had a gentleman by the name of Rick Armetti who had been up in the forecastle below decks in the front part of the ship. And he hears this funny noise. <laughs> He said, I didn't realize it until later. That was a near-miss torpedo that had passed ahead of the ship. Right. Boy, didn't that make the hair stand up on the back of your neck. So they launched five. They hit the USS Liberty with one. One. Uh, they also had the, the unmarked airplanes, 3,000 rounds. Of How big were the shells that they were firing? Um, the Israelis were using a 30-millimeter cannon fire at the time. The projectile is about the size of a cigar. Uh, there were 3,100 of those strikes by accident aboard the USS Liberty. There were 826 large caliber strikes. We're talking about 40 millimeter cannon fire, which would not penetrate the three, three quarter inch steel that was the exterior hull of the ship. But when they struck, they splattered and left red hot shrapnel everywhere. That's what many of the casualties from the, the deck crew were, was from the shrapnel from those 40 millimeter cannon strikes. Now at this point in the day, uh, what, what time did the attack start? Uh, the attack was roughly 1400 hours local time, two o'clock, give or take a few minutes, but um, my wife had given me for my birthday in December of the previous year, 1966, a, a new Timex watch. At the time, you had to wind your watch. Timex developed one that had a little weight inside it that when you moved your arm, that weight would swing around and wind your watch. And I was pretty choice of that watch. The torpedo had torn it off my arm. And later when I went back to the ship off the when I was sent back from the Carry America, I went down below decks, and uh, one of the sailors told me, he said, we, we've got several watches there. He said, you can go over there and find it. Well, I did find it. The crystal was gone. It was full of uh, debris, uh, oil from the bunker fuel tank that had ruptured, but the hands were stuck at 220. According to the NSA, timeline. Uh, the flyovers started at 6 a.m. So all morning, the Israelis were flying over and you guys were sunbathing, which uh, an Arab country wouldn't be doing. Wouldn't be doing. Right. Um, at 12.05, three motor torpedo boats are ordered to proceed toward El Arish. The attack on the Liberty, they say, started at 1.56, but at 2.20, um, that's when the aircraft stopped shooting, it says. So do you have, have you seen the NSA timeline of events and do you have any major discrepancies in how they were covering it versus? I'm unfamiliar with it. Okay. It uh, was at the end of the, uh, I think the Chicago Tribune article used it for a lot of the bases and what they had That would probably up. be accurate because okay. they would have had the information that was available under Freedom of Information They're Act. They're like the scorekeepers. They had all the data to make. Yes, things. yes. Let's talk about the missing NSA tape. So they have a tape of the whole aftermath, except for at 2.29, starting time for an NSA tape of Israeli communications after the attack. A previous tape, which presumably would have captured the air and torpedo attacks, is missing. Do you think the tape is missing by accident? Is it an accident? Or do you think the tape is purposely missing because it might have some embarrassing evidence? Really, I wouldn't know. But excuse me, what would be your good guess? 
I should probably interject here, El Arish. We were 13 and a half nautical miles off El Arish. El Arish was where the Egyptian troops were so brutally murdered. The Israelis claimed they were being shelled by the sea. Well, that would have to be a warship, and the only warship out there was the USS Liberty. Well, excuse me, uh, it would take a pretty large caliber ship at sea to lob a shell that far. The truth of the matter is the explosions were captured ammunition that the Israelis were blowing up. Captured Egyptian ammunition, not shell fire from the sea. And excuse me, the El Qasir, the so-called warship they claim they mistook us for, World War I Egyptian horse carrier, which had not been to sea for 20 years, was waiting to be cut up for scrap. It's ironic, you look in Jane's All the World's Fighting Ships, and it says her only armament is a four-inch muzzle-loading cannon. Now you keep mentioning Jane's because that's the Bible for identifying That's the Bible for identifying armament. ships at sea. Right. Liberty would be identified as a non-combatant ship, general technical research, which means she is not a military target. Now you would think during all the flyovers during the morning, if it's an accident, that doesn't make much sense. So if you look at it, it's a, there's Israel's at war, they're carrying out a, a campaign in that area, they see that ship, they see it as a danger, a threat to their plan. So from a, a military side, you would want to disable its communications first, and then you might want to scuttle it. Did the attack or the accidental attack happen in an order where they might have taken out antennas and communication equipment first and then sought to take the ship out? The, uh, the aircraft fire was directed pretty much at our transmitting antenna. It's my understanding they used some heat-seeking missiles and any active antenna would have produced heat. Uh, the, the fire was pretty accurate against all of our transmitting. There were large cylinders that kept the tuning forks and, and uh, um, gear for those transmitters inside these large steel cylinders. And uh, every one of them had a large caliber strike onto them. So that seems intentional, that they knew exactly what they were targeting and how to destroy it effectively. Well, excuse which is, me, but what were the overflights for except to figure out exactly what was going on yeah. and what they needed right. to get? Reconnaissance. Right. The, the first aircraft strikes pretty well disabled all of our ability to transmit. Uh, there's some talk that a, a sailor carried a coax cable to the after part of the ship and there was a whip antenna back there which was not active. Um, there's some talk that the May Day went out over that whip antenna, but I just had uh, an overnight stay with a gentleman by the name of Glenn Oliphant who was an old branch uh, Navy communicator aboard the ship. My wife and I spent the night with Glenn and his wife in uh, um, Minneapolis, Minnesota, and Glenn told me actually that Mayday transmission had gone out over a long wire which was relatively impervious to air attack. It would take an actual piece of shrapnel having to strike that wire directly to disable it. So that would have been relatively impervious to uh, strikes from the aircraft. At the time, the USS Liberty is a mobile listening post, a mobile spy base. Yes. At the same time, the United States had a secret listening station in City Yahia in Morocco. Would they have picked up the May Day? Would that station, which had very similar equipment, had similar capabilities, have been in on that firefight? I think that's very likely. One of the excuses that the National Security Agency put out was supposedly that uh, we used a five-letter group as address code. Each one of those five-letter groups was a different recipient. Uh, the excuse was that the wrong address group was being used and a message was supposedly sent to the Liberty to get out of the immediate area. But to Joe Lentini, who was the, the first sailor that I pulled loose from the wreckage, uh, he and I became pretty close friends. 
and Joe was his responsibility for communication with both uh, shore base stations and uh, communications with the Sixth Fleet. And Joe told me that was absolutely impossible. He said any message which was sent to us either directly or through the Sixth Fleet would have been received. What time did the attack on the USS Liberty end? I honestly don't know exactly, but I'm assuming from the length of time that it was very close to two hours. The official version is 75 minutes. But excuse me, when that helicopter came over from the embassy, we didn't know. We were thought we were under attack again. Right. Now, how was the helicopter marked? Uh, the, 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 uh, is my understanding that three helicopters were all plainly marked with the Star of David. The uh, Israeli excuse was the, heli the first two helicopters were sent over to rescue survivors that were in the water. Excuse me, they got belts of ammunition around their shoulders and automatic weapons and hand grenades hanging off them. What's that for, shooting sharks? The official timeline lists 1.56 p.m. to 3.16 p.m. Does that seem about right? That to... seems about right. Okay. Now, the, uh, the ambassador who drops the pouch with the orange in yes. the note, he can clearly see yes. what's going on. Yes. And yet the note says, do you have any casualties? Do you have casualties? Which gets him the social finger as a response. Yes. Right. That's an appropriate response to that situation. Why do you think he was in the helicopter dropping the orange in the first place? Um... <clears throat> That's a good question. Uh, he was a U.S. naval attaché. Now that we supposedly know that it's a U.S. ship, well, of course, the U.S. naval attaché needs to be notified for communications. That would be my pretty good guess. Um, in 1992, October of 1992, NBC television ran a special. Uh, the story behind the story, the attack on the USS Liberty. Commander Castle was in that movie, and he used this phrase. He said, the Israelis didn't intend to deliberately attack that ship. He said, if they'd done so, if they'd intended to attack that ship, they would have done so with Rouge de Gere. I'm no French linguist, but whatever that was. But he just thoroughly disgusted me in that interview. So he's a U.S. Navy military attache to Israel, stationed in Tel Aviv. His offices are where? Are they, are in, they Tel in, Tel Aviv. in Tel Aviv. Yes. So he had time to get, the, the attack is long enough that he had time to be called, get on a helicopter. Get on a helicopter and fly out there. Okay. I would guess that that probably would have been local time about 3.30. I would think there would be some sort of moral conflict for Israeli fighter pilots who are knowingly attacking an allied ship. I would think they would want double, triple confirmation. I would think maybe some of these guys might refuse their orders. Is there any evidence that either the orders were questioned and confirmed or that pilots uh, uh, disobeyed orders and didn't attack? There was one Israeli pilot. Most, mind you, most of these pilots were trained here in the United States. One of those pilots, I understand, refused to fire on the ship was told that he was, he was he told ground control that it's an American ship. A ground controller told him, you have your orders, attack the ship. He said, it's an American ship, refused to fire, returned to base, was arrested, spent time in an Israeli prison. Um, I believe his name was Lev Tovey. I'm not, he also used an alias besides that. But uh, a, a retired U.S. congressman by the name of Pete McCloskey uh, Pete McCloskey was in the Marines. He was a combat Marine infantry officer in Korean War. Awarded the Navy Cross, awarded the Silver Star, awarded the Bronze Star, awarded at least two Purple Hearts, and we became friends. And in a conversation over the phone, uh, Re Representative McCloskey told me that he had interviewed this Israeli pilot in the federal medical prison in Springfield, Missouri in 1986. Uh, Representative McCloskey sent me a copy of that dossier. It's about three-eighths of an inch thick. 
about his interview with this pilot and with some other interviews that he had done with an Israeli Mossad agent who had defected. Uh, it, I thought it was rather interesting from this dossier that this Mossad agent refused to come to the United States after he defected. He went to Canada. He feared for his life here in the United States. Indeed, the pilot that attacked us was supposed to have been released from prison after he served out his term. He had been sentenced to five years for bank fraud here in the United States. He was supposed to have been released there at Federal Medical Prison in Springfield, Missouri. He was sent to New York City and released in New York City and disappeared. The unmarked airplanes that attacked the USS Liberty, the whole time they're speaking back and forth with their command. Is there any evidence or recordings of the conversations that went on prior to, during, or after the USS Liberty attack? To my knowledge, there was none aboard Liberty, but there were American planes overhead at the time of the attack, both U.S. Navy and U.S. Air Force planes that were copying the transmissions. Was there a U.S. submarine in the area? There was. The USS Amberjack was in the area at the time. She was conducting a super secret operation. Um, I understand that crew members from the Amberjack were watching the attack through the periscope. And the racket from the attack on the Liberty was so loud, crew members from the Amberjack thought that they were being depth charged. The evidence of the alleged war crimes that you spoke to earlier, the, the strafing of the lifeboats, is there any evidence of these lifeboats being shot by the planes or? Um, one of those life rafts that, that wasn't disinflated, the line connecting the ship to the life raft was severed by the machine gun fire from the Israeli motor torpedo boat. That torpedo boat came in close. I heard the engines and picked up that life raft and took it aboard. It was clearly labeled U.S. Navy. I understand that that life raft is in the Israeli Naval Museum in Haifa as a trophy of war, along with the ship's wheel from the torpedo boat that attacked us. Why would you collect trophies of an accident? That's a very good question. After this couple, few arduous hours of being under attack, not knowing who's attacking the ship, really, until you see the torpedo boats, right? That's correct. And then the helicopters came after that. They were also... Marked, That's correct. Right? After that, what is the aftermath of the crew? How many wounded? How many killed in this... Um, Claimed accident. There were, uh, yeah, claimed accident. There were 34 killed in the attacks. Nine were killed in the air raids, air raids topside. 25 were killed by the torpedo explosion. There was a total of 208 Purple Hearts awarded out of a crew of 294. Several men who had wounds were not badly wounded, and there was so much carnage, our medical staff was horribly overworked and a lot of fellows never even reported the fact that they were wounded. Um, one of the chiefs aboard the ship, Joe Bankert, had a Israeli 30 millimeter shell in his calf. He was a Boy Scout leader. He uh, got a first aid kit dug the projectile out of his calf and patched himself up. He doesn't have a Purple Heart, but he's got the bullet. Well, the USS Liberty is one of the most heavily decorated crews. The crew of the Liberty is the most heavily decorated crew of any U.S. naval ship in history. Is that? My understanding since World War II, there may have been some that were more highly decorated during World War II. How many Congressional Medals of Honor were awarded? There was one awarded. Um, Dr. Richard Kiefer, a ship surgeon, um, Lieutenant Commander Jim Ennis, who was author of the book Assault on the Liberty, and uh, Senior Chief Petty Officer Stan White 
all recommended me for the Medal of Honor, and um, Captain McGonagall refused to forward it. The Congressional Medal of Honor that was awarded, it was, of course, awarded by LBJ in the White House, because that's how they do that. No, it was actually um, awarded in the Naval Yard there in Washington, D.C., by the Secretary of the Navy. Uh, Ironically, while lesser awards were being awarded across town in the White House by the president. My understanding was that LBJ at that time was uh, giving awards to high school kids or something to that effect. I, I something in comparison that made it very trivial and made, made me ask the trivial, question, yes. why was the president distancing himself in, a, in giving these awards? Uh, especially that in honor of this magnitude, just... I think there's only one other time in history there was, I understand there was a Marine from Korea that was awarded it, and it was given by a, a Marine general instead of by the president. Did you ever read the book by Major General Smedley Butler? I have read some of his writings, yes. He won the Congressional Medal of Honor twice. He was, twice. One, he was the most heavily decorated Marine in history. He wrote that book, War is a Racket because there was that 1935-1934 McCormick-Dickstein scandal where the fascists had tried to take over the White House and they were leading a coup. And I always thought it was an interesting warning from a guy who had been through all these different military campaigns. At the end of his career, what does he have to say? And he's basically giving you a lot of clues to how the world works. George Washington, in his farewell address to the nation, warned America about getting too cozy with foreign powers at the time, uh, the Marquis de Lafayette had both given troops and a tremendous sum of money to the American colonies to win their independence. And he was practically worshipped by Americans. There are towns named after Lafayette. There are streets and libraries named after Lafayette. And General Washington warned us about getting too cozy with that foreign power, having in mind that cozy relationship with Lafayette. All right, shoot forward a couple hundred years. What about this cozy relationship with Israel that gives them license to do whatever they want? And the American Congress turns a deaf ear. Article 1, Section 8 of the U.S. Constitution, duties of Congress. Congress shall investigate felonies on the high seas and max of piracy against American vessels and interests. Congress has never done so. We have a letter from the Secretary to the Congress stating that there has never been a congressional investigation in the attack on the USS Liberty. In 2009, I'm living in uh, Stratford, Missouri. I've had a farm there for the last nearly 20 years. A neighbor of mine is a fellow by the name of Roy Blunt. I've known him since he was uh, Greene County. Um, secretary that took care of elections. He later became a U.S. congressman in uh, uh, Veterans Day in 2009. Stratford High School, every Veterans Day, puts on a big shindig for the town veterans. They invite their families to come, treat them to breakfast. There's a big assembly in the gymnasium and patriotic songs and a band plays and patriotic speeches. I was invited to speak on the attack on the USS Liberty and in a matter of just a few minutes laid down the facts that Israel had deliberately attacked our ship. The Constitution requires Congress to investigate it. They have never done so. Roy Blunt was introduced as having attended Stratford High School, but they didn't bother to tell the kids he'd been expelled for getting the Baptist preacher's daughter pregnant. Excuse me, his ex-wife, Rosemary, is a very dear friend. His mother, his, her mother is a very dear friend. Um, her father was pastor of the church that we're members of and has been for years. He's passed away now, but uh, Betty is still alive. And um, Roy Blunt gets up and says the first word out of his mouth, said, Bryce and everyone here, we need to remember that Israel is our best ally. And if Iran continues their pursuit of acquiring nuclear weapons, we're going to need Israel's friendship. I thought, why am I wasting my time? 
Um, some years after that, I was giving a lecture <clears throat> to a conservative Republican group in Tulsa, Oklahoma. There was a lady there who had served in the Oklahoma legislature, and she came to me afterwards and said, Mr. Lockwood, aren't uh, the Israelis our allies? And I said, ma'am, we don't have allies, we have users. Well, the same sort of special relationship exists with Great Britain. Now, when George Washington is saying, let's avoid foreign entanglements, he might also be talking about the country they just fought to get away from, but we share a language which over time allowed that country, they just, uh, didn't the royal family just marry into an American family? Like, <laughs> we're joined at the hip now, and it's been getting ever like that. I mean, it's getting like that ever since 1814 at the end of uh, the War of 1812, Battle of New Orleans. That was the last time we fought the British with guns. But since then, there has been a plan in the, in the making through you know, lots of historical documents and artifacts that show an ever growing influence over our foreign and domestic policies, especially the surveillance on people. That's a very British thing. They had a lot of, uh, first off, GCHQ, their version of the NSA, is 50 years older than our NSA. General Communications Headquarters. <laughs> and they were tapping telegraph lines, you know, transatlantic cable lines, like they helped create the infrastructure. So it's like a big brother system for our NSA. The British system of GCHQ is like the big brother and the, the American system of NSA is like a little brother. And we've been, so since World War II, the British are embedded throughout our intelligence system. So when the USS Liberty is picking up these transmissions, Britain and their intelligence system is getting those transmissions at the same time. And a good chance the Soviets are getting them at the same time because they had so many moles and spies. And that also comes as part of the special relationship with Britain because they seem to run a lot of those Soviet spies out of Cambridge. Um, so there is a whole lot of dynamics going on. The, the Israeli foreign policy going against American foreign policy, Israel being able to basically assassinate American military personnel without an investigation, without military intervention. Uh, I'm sure there was some sort of civil suit or settlement as a result of that because they apologized. Historically, they apologized. What was the result of the civil settlement? Do you know? Uh I don't think a civil settlement ever went forward. Um, um, I was actually TAD in the summer of 1968, back to uh, VQ2 at Rota, Spain. When I returned home to Bremerhaven, Germany, um, my wife had a little homecoming party for me, and uh, as people were breaking up and leaving, my wife handed me an envelope. She said, uh, you got this letter from the State Department. And it was a letter from the State Department telling me that uh, there had been negotiations with the Israelis and they had agreed to make a damaged settlement and that sometime in the future I would be receiving a check. I finally did get that check while I was in Vietnam in 1969 and the check was from the United States Treasury and sent to me by the U.S. State Department. What was the total of that check, if you don't mind me asking? I would prefer not to answer that. Was there a settlement that determined the value of each military personnel's life there for was, their families? There was. There was the family involved, um, the ranking of the individual, and uh, the seriousness of their wounds. Some uh, received a pretty small check and some received a rather generous check. It's my understanding the average check to the families of those that were killed was a uh, six-figure, low six-figure uh, number. Um, if you adjust that for inflation, take into account the settlements at uh, 91101, we received a pittance compared to what those people were paid. So they put a price, lawyers on both sides negotiated the price back in 1967, 68. That's correct. And that price has now inflated for 9-11 victims. They get more. Really Considerably. Crazy. Now, the fact that they had to negotiate over what American military personnel lives were worth, I, that's kind of disgusting. But I recall reading someplace that they had made a decision or come to an agreement that children under five weren't significantly uh, traumatized by the event, and so there was not an accounting for an allocation of cash for the, their futures without a father, probably. When I returned from the ship, <clears throat> um, my mission at VQ2 Road of Spain was in civilian clothes, so I only had uh, working uniforms with me. The rest was civilian clothes. 
Um, when I was medevaced off to the Carrier America, I didn't have a uniform to wear except the working uniform that I had on. Uh, there just happened to be another staff sergeant in the Marine Detachment aboard USS America. It was the same size I was, same rank I was, a very pleasant African-American gentleman, and he kindly loaned me a khaki uniform. Well, I had to wear that uniform. My flight back to uh, uh, the island of Malta, I was taken back aboard the ship. And I wanted that oil from that bunker that had ruptured was everywhere in the ship. Every time you climbed or went down a, a ladder way, that oil was against the steps to that ladder way, and the whole front part of my uniform was covered with that smelly black oil. I had flavor blisters in my face, and this was oozing a yellowish pus out of there. That was all down the front of the uniform. I had to wear that for the two days, two full days. Then I got orders to uh, return to my home base in Bremerhaven, still wearing the same uniform. Uh, they sent me to uh, 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 Naples, Italy, to the Naval Hospital at Naples, Italy. I should have insisted on their keeping me there, but I wanted to get back to my family, and this is on a Sunday morning. They, uh, they gave me, uh, I, I took a train from there to Rome and caught a flight out of Rome. I was carrying a Samsonite suitcase, and that Samsonite suitcase had been in a baggage locker up in the forecastle, the front part of the ship, and had taken a piece of an Israeli shell in it. The hole on one side was about this big, and the hole on the other side was about this big. Here's my dirty laundry hanging out that hole, and I was an ugly, stinking mess. Got to go through customs. I got my orders and my ID card with me. I handed it to the customs official, and he didn't even look at it. He just grabbed his stomach and waved me through. It was, uh, I landed somewhere, I think, I, I think in, I don't even remember the name of the town that I landed at in Bremerhaven, or in Germany, and then had to catch another train from there to my home base in Bremerhaven. When I got back to, to Bremerhaven, I didn't have the key to the apartment. We lived on the second floor. And I tried the door, and there was no one home. And the neighbor lady, <coughs> a lady by the name of Betty Bry, came to the door and, and saw me. And she kind of grabbed her stomach. And she said, oh, Bry, she said, uh, Lois went out to base to get the mail. I said, come on in here. I'll get you a cup of coffee. She sat me down over in the corner, and I didn't think anything about it, but it was away from the door. And, got me a cup of coffee and sometime later she heard the car pull in she said oh here's lois now and she went out to the stairwell and my wife and children climbed the stairwell and betty said lois you need to come in here my wife had just gotten a letter from her mother that her grandfather had passed away my wife was closer to her grandmother than she was her own mother there was a strained relationship between my wife and her mother. So this is just heart-wrenching to her. And here's her husband with his face all blurred, fever blisters, stinking. My wife had just burst into tears. It was just beyond imagination for her. My youngest daughter, um, Dorothy, would have been uh, just four and a half years old at the time, and she burst into tears, and she said, that's not my daddy. My uh, <clears throat> wonderful commanding officer, most of the fellows from the ship, when they got back to their next duty station, were given 30 days basket leave. They tap up your leave letters and let you go, and when you get back, you tear them up. <clears throat> My commanding officer called me into his office the next morning. He says, well, the best way for you to get over this is to work. So he put me on watch standing, 12 hours on, 12 hours off. And I had to go to the doctor. I was standing midnight watches. I had to go to the doctor on my off-duty time during the day. And as uh, some of the other fellows drifted in, that were sent there from the Liberty. I, don't, I recall exactly, but I think there were about 18 altogether officers and enlisted that came to Bremerhaven that were a ship's crew. Um, one of them was um, Lieutenant Commander Ennis. He was, uh, he was my 
duty watch officer. Whenever I had a message that had to be released, I had to have a duty watch officer signature. And night watch, this one, it was rather calm. Jim and I would sit in his office and talk about the attack on the ship. And I said, Mr. Ennis, somebody ought to write a book about this. Little did I realize at the time he was writing notes and smugging them out, keeping them in his bachelor officer's quarters area, and later began writing that book, Assault on the Liberty. In December of 1979, I was attending Baptist Bible College in Springfield, Missouri, and one of my classmates had gone home into Texas over the Christmas holidays. The holidays are over, and I'm in homiletics class waiting for the class to begin, and this gentleman comes in, and he says to me, Bryce, were you on a ship that was torpedoed? I said, how did you know about that? He said, well, I was in Texas over the Christmas holidays, and I was returning home. It was late at night, and I was listening to National Public Radio, and there was a program titled uh, Radio Reader. And the gentleman was reading Jim Ennis's book, Assault on the Liberty. And it was that portion of the chapter, Torpedo Attack, where my events of the day were narrated. And so I knew the book existed, but it wasn't until I graduated and um, later was given a position as assistant pastor at a Baptist Church in Key West, Florida. One of the members of the congregation was the librarian at the public library, and so I asked her if she knew about that book. She said, yes, we have that book. She said, there's a pretty lengthy waiting list. I said, well, please put my name on the waiting list. Well, it was better than two months before I got the book, but uh, I immediately wrote a letter to the publishers, it was Random House Publishers, and told them that I'd like to get in touch with the author, Jim Ennis. And they sent me back a very nice letter and said, we have forwarded your letter to Mr. Ennis. Well, it was only about 10 days or so after that, I got a big, thick letter from Mr. Ennis, and it had copies of the newsletters that he had copied off for me and uh, phone numbers for crew members. And I immediately got on the phone. I called Lu Lieutenant Painter in Texas, and I called Mr. Ennis, and I visited with him, and I tried to contact some of the families of men that worked for me that were killed, and um, it was just an emotional emotional time. Richard Larry Weaver was part of the deck crew and very seriously wounded with shrapnel in the air attacks. Larry Weaver was a picture of uh, physical ability. He had a tentative agreement with uh, Cypress Gardens in Florida uh, back in the 50s and 60s. They had a water team that would uh, be towed on skis and they did a pyramid and uh, Larry was to be the top man in that water ski pyramid but he was so severely wounded he couldn't accept the position he went through a long series of operations and he's really not right today now the the planes you referred to earlier where they switched from nuclear to conventional weapons were those carrier based planes were those fighters those were carrier based planes aboard the USS Saratoga okay so they also had live nuclear ammunition on board during an exercise, they claimed to exercise, right? Because the Six Day War was going on for four or five days at this point. So it is a war zone, but it wasn't a war we were involved in. But only because of the Soviet specter on the other side that we had to have live armaments of a nuclear variety on our, our planes? And I would think that the, the planes that were on the ready that had nuclear weapons were in case there was an actual war going on. Okay. Uh, that involved the Soviets. My, my, my belief is that that would have been disconnected from a so-called nuclear exercise. Right. They would have been there on the ready in case of war. Right. Fully equipped. In my opinion, there were probably three different excuses. Number one was the brutal murdering of prisoners of war. This is a very serious war crimes charge. Number two was the perceived attack on Golan Heights, which would be in violation of the tacit agreement between the Johnson administration and the Israeli government not to attack Golan Heights. Uh, number three is the one that raises the largest question. 
When Lyndon Johnson came on the air and said, get those aircraft back, I will not have my allies embarrassed. How did he know his allies were attacking us since they were using unmarked aircraft? Is there a possibility that he knew that he set us up for this attack to blame Egypt and use that as an excuse for Americans' interjection into the war? That would be three very serious reasons. Well, with respect to reason three, that plan of, as you said, blaming it on the Egyptians, using it as a casus belli to get into the war, that sounds a lot like the Northwoods document from 1963 that L.L. Lemnitzer put out there where they suggested doing very similar tactics to Cuba. Was the USS motive, Oxford involved? Motive, opportunity, these sort of things fall into line if you ask that question. Uh, that conversation was in the White House between um, General uh, David M. Shoup, who was a Marine Corps Commandant, and Lemonser, and that's on tape. And uh, this is painful to me because I, I really looked up to David Shoup. He was not only the Commandant of the Marine Corps, he was also recipient of the Medal of Honor from the Pacific battles in World War II. And here they are talking about setting up the USS Oxford as a scapegoat for getting the U.S. involved during the Cuban Missile Crisis. Those type of tactics are absent from U.S. intelligence history until after we start the special relationship with Great Britain. But it seems that those tactics have a history in their, their war history. Like if there's a trend of that in their military history. Not only theirs, but ours. Right. Now it's an adopted tactic that is used, just like um, foreign intervention, which kind of came in in 1898 with the Spanish-American War. It was uh, Roger Kipling who, who said, uh, it was called The White Man's Burden, a, a poem he wrote about America's responsibility to get behind this English-speaking British Empire and to, to rejoin. That was a, a, one of the beginning attempts to ameliorate America back into the British Empire, and it's gone on since then. What are you? Rudyard Kipling also warned us about involvement with Afghanistan. Um, he wrote, a, a, I believe, a narrative poem about it, liking the Soviet Union to a bear and the individual being representative of Great Britain. And when I turned my head, the bear took off my head. Yeah, when I turned my back, the bear took off my head. Yeah, Kipling has a lot of, you know, he wrote the book uh, Kim, which is a spy novel that is used to train spies' memories, keep in memory. So it's like a, so there's a whole lot to Kipling from a British perspective that Americans, we just think he writes a jungle book and kids, kids yes. stories. But really, he was a highly refined intelligence agent who was embedding things in his writings to be able to train future students of spycraft. Very brilliant individual. Very brilliant. What colors was the USS Liberty flying that day? Uh, Liberty was flying the US flag, standard procedure. During the first air raid, that flag was shot down. Uh, Joseph Metters, who was our signalman aboard the Liberty, ran that flag back up again. It was shot down a second time. That's the one that's pictured both in the book Assault on the Liberty and on the back of my business card. The third flag that was run up was the holiday flag. That's the largest one you have aboard ship. Absolutely impossible not to mistake it. Besides the fact that the Israelis claim it was a case of mistaken identity and their pilots would have had to have been colorblind. While the wounded were being treated on other ships, what happens to the USS Liberty? It would probably go into dry dock, but where, for how long, what do they do? Early on the morning of June the 9th, um, two destroyers from the 6th Fleet came alongside. Uh, the USS uh, Davis was one of them, DD-935. I forget right off the top of my head what the other destroyer was, but. Uh, Damage control personnel and medical personnel came over from the Davis. Uh, I became acquainted with the Davis crew and attend their reunions pretty regularly. The uh, current president of the Davis reunion, a gentleman by the name of John Conroy, during 
the uh, Six Days War, he was a yeoman aboard the USS Davis. He was sent over by whale boat the morning of June the 9th. They just had breakfast. He was on board that whale boat along with damage control and medical personnel. There was a Jacob's Ladder put over the side, starboard side of the ship. Mr. Conroy climbed that Jacob's Ladder, got to the top of the ladder, took one look at all the blood and gore that was still there, lost his breakfast and almost fell over backwards into the sea. Recovered himself and got aboard her, then spent the next 30 some hours plus just typing up death certificates and letters to next of kin. Was the ship repaired, painted? Um, what did they do to? The ship was ordered to go to Malta, the island of Malta. Actually, there was a dry dock in the island of Crete, which is much closer, two days sailing closer at her damaged condition. Um, George Golden, who is Liberty's da uh, damage control officer, told me at one of our reunions, he said, Sarge, that bulkhead was breathing from the action of the ocean. Steel doesn't do a whole lot of that breathing without breaking. Why was Liberty ordered to go to Malta, which is another two full days sailing? We think there's a possibility that she was, our government was hoping she would go down and the evidence would be destroyed. Was the ship listing at that point? Yes, heavily listing to starboard where the torpedo hole was. Was there any uh, repair or attempted makeshift repair to cover that torpedo? Makeshift repairs were done. There were uh, ma mattresses were stuffed into the hole and temporary bulkhead was erected and mm -hmm. shoring was placed on there. And uh, there was a man by the name of Larry Bowen. Currently, he's one of the officers of a Liberty Veterans Association was part of that damage control party and his duties while the ship was en route to Malta was being down there, sealed in, keeping an eye on that bulkhead in case it collapsed. What was to happen to him if it did? During one of the breaks you mentioned uh, an American ambassador to Jordan who had told you of his role in the, in the, in the events. Last year on the 50th anniversary of the attack on the Liberty, we gathered at Arlington National Cemetery for remembrance for our fall, and I was in full Marine Corps dress uniform. A gentleman came over by the name of a Dr. Tony Wells, who does coordination work between American government and British government, Navy, Navy's involved. He's written a very good book titled Two Navies. He introduced me to a gentleman I had with him by the name of Richard Veets. Richard Veets, during the 1960s, was the United States ambassador to Jordan. Dick Veets told me that he had been given, while he was ambassador, a letter by the U.S. State Department to deliver personally to Moshe Dayan. He was uh, brought into the home, told that Moshe Dayan was in the the backyard, went out to the backyard. He said there was ornate artwork everywhere around, statues and artwork and beautiful things taken. He told Moshe Dayan he had this letter from the State Department, handed it to, to Mr. Dayan. He opened the letter, looked at it, sat down, handed the letter back to Ambassador Veets and said, you read it to me, you know my eye. It was about a four page letter. Ambassador Veets read it to him. He began to, a smile began to flicker across his face towards the end of the letter. It was a scathing letter from the State Department. As the ambassador finished reading the letter, he said, Moshe Dayan leaned back, closed his eyes and said, we will double cross that bridge when we get there. What did you take that to mean? 
I would take that to mean that Israel's not a true friend. When we were talking earlier about MI6, MI6 uh, and, and British Naval Intelligence are a very old school outfit. They have a long history of doing what they do, whereas America, we really just in the 20th century emulated a lot of the systems for intelligence work that they had set up, right? Um, they had, during World War II, what the uh, chief of MI6, John Cecil Masterman, called a double-cross system, which was a covert system of intelligence that ran parallel to the external system of intelligence. So it's like a, a compartmentalized super top secret relationship and circulation of information that comes from spying on their allies. Britain has spied on their ally America for a long time. Israel has made America a target many times, and I'm sure America spies on, on its allies as well, because that's how the game is played, right? Um, the double cross system is definitely relevant to that thread of history, especially with the, the Cold War originally starting from the great game, and then during the Cold War they called it the new great game, right? Um, that is what they've been playing, I think. And that plays into the USS Liberty attack. Attack. Absolutely. Because those special relationships are based on national security and national security is secrets that are they're in the shape of lies because they can't tell you the truth about those events. So what role do you think national security plays in the overall lack of response, lack of investigation, lack of any type of justice in that situation? It seems to me like we were the sacrificial lamb for the relationship between the Israeli government and the U.S. government, which to me is maddening. How do you feel about all the families that, that didn't get their, their loved one back because of that attack? I made up my mind back in the 1980s. I was going to look up the families of all those that worked for me that were killed, and I did so. Uh, <clears throat> Jim Ennis sent me a copy of an article from a Newsweek magazine back, uh, I think, about 1986, 1987. That was about... Uh, Tommy Thornton, one of the French linguists that worked for me, who was killed, and it gave his hometown of Springfield, Ohio. Well, I got on the phone and called directory assistants and got the phone number for Raymond Thornton. And when the phone rang, a lady answered it who was Tommy's mother. And she said, oh, Ray, come quickly. This is Tommy's supervisor from the USS Liberty. Um, we became pretty close. We wrote letters back and forth together with, unfortunately, shortly after that conversation, uh, Ray Thornton passed away. And then within the past few years, Mrs. Thornton also passed away. But I was able to go to Maplewood Cemetery there in Springfield, Ohio, with Tommy's mom and held her as she wept and I wept over the grave of her son. Likewise with uh, Eddie Remar, Corporal Eddie Remar. He was from uh, Small Town Railroad, Pennsylvania. And um, I had didn't realize where he was from. I'm working for a grocery company. I have to be to work at midnight and I can't sleep. I got up and got out my scrapbook with all my notes from the USS Liberty and letters and so forth that I had. And among that was a newsletter from the USS America that gave the hometowns of those who were killed. And I don't remember seeing that before, but listed Ed Raymar's hometown as Railroad, Pennsylvania. So I got on the phone, called directory assistance, and asked for uh, Edward Raymar. And the operator said, I really wanted to look her up and profusely thank her. She said, I don't have anyone listed in Railroad, Pennsylvania by that name, but there is a Ray Meyer listed in Shrewsbury, Pennsylvania. And when I dialed the phone number, Eddie Ray Meyer's mom, Virginia Ray Meyer, answered the phone and said pretty much the same thing. Oh, Speed, come quickly. It's Eddie's supervisor from the USS Liberty. And I was crying so hard I could barely carry out a conversation, but 
we became pretty close. And there again, uh, Virginia came down with Alzheimer's and passed away about six years or so ago. And then Eddie's dad ran a produce business in Shrewsbury, Pennsylvania. And he, um, he was a heavy smoker through the years and unfortunately came down with cancer. But he lived, I think, into his 90s and he just passed away about a year ago. I'm sure for a lot of these families, you can never get over turmoil like that. So in one way, their passing eases that, that cruel and unusual torture of having a loved one killed and not having it brought to justice. Um, uh, Carl Nigren that worked for me, Carl's family was from uh, Delaware County, New York, Andes, New York. Um, I didn't find out there again until much later that he was from Andes. I ran his family down also in uh, Delaware County, New York, was homesteaded by my mother's ancestors back in the 17th century. There again, we became pretty close. His mom just passed away about two years ago. Uh, she was a colorful lady. She was in the Women's Coast Guard during World War II. And uh, actually, up until she was approaching her 90s, she would always walk in the Memorial Day Parade with her uniform that she could still wear from World War II. I was going to ask about your motivation, what makes you and drives you and inspires you to continue going out and spreading this message. But I think what you just described is a healing process. You're searching for justice, but there's also a healing process there that goes on through reaching out and looking these people up and trying to get in touch with them. Well, you could call it what you like, healing process or whatever. I want to see justice done for the USS Liberty. Constitution requires Congress to do their duty. They have not done so. Well, it's like an untreated wound. It hasn't yes. been triaged. It hasn't been treated. It hasn't been healed. Festering. 51 years. What can be done now that hasn't been done in the past 51 years to bring liberty and justice? I wish I knew the answer to that. I've tried my best to twist arms of congressmen. My dad's sister, uh, Edna Hansen, went to Henry's Restaurant in the little town of Afton, New York, where I graduated from high school. Sat down in Henry's Restaurant and collected well over 200 signatures calling on Congress to investigate the attack on the USS Liberty. Uh, her congressperson at that time, I think his name was uh, Sherwood Boo Hurt. I may not have that exactly correct, but I think that's pretty close. Wrote her a very nice letter back that he would look into it. Never did a thing. I think pretty much what is happening throughout the rest of the people that have written letters to the congressman. Yeah, we'll look into it. Never do. Hope it just goes away. Well, the inaction of the past 51 years brings us to the topic of the American Legion Resolution. Now, this requires a little bit of reading on my part, so if you'll pardon my spectacles. Can you tell us about American Legion Resolution 201740, which calls on the U.S. Congress to publicly, impartially, and thoroughly investigate the attack on the USS Liberty and its aftermath? The American Legion is the largest military veterans organization in the United States, and that's quite a large force to have behind you. So my question is, how did the resolution originate and make it to the National Convention of the American Legion for a vote? There's a young woman by the name of uh, <coughs> Michelle Kanukin, um, <coughs> Seattle, Washington. During the 80s, Michelle was in the U.S. Coast Guard, she was assigned aboard a buoy tender. She was en route to the South Pacific with this buoy tender. They stopped off in Pearl Harbor on the way out there, and she's going through some of the military memorabilia at Pearl Harbor and came across a picture of the USS Liberty and some brief statements about it and tweaked her imagination. When she got to Guam, where the boy tender was ported, 
she started doing some digging and reading onto it. Years later, after she got out of the Coast Guard, she decided she wanted to do something about it. In uh, 2017, the Washington State Department of the American Legion passed a resolution under her leadership to investigate the attack on the USS Liberty. The resolution was done very expertly, very expertly. Uh, Michelle contacted the president of our USS Liberty Veterans Association asking if someone could usher that resolution through the American Legion Convention. We had had an unpleasant experience in 2012 with the American Legion in Indianapolis, Indiana. Uh, were literally thrown out of the convention. Our chaplain for the USS Liberty Veterans Association was arrested for sexual assault. He didn't do anything nearly like that, but held in prison overnight. The next morning, the charges were dropped and... Glenn Elephant, our chaplain, was released, but uh, the American Legion used that excuse for banning us. In fact, I have a letter in my phone this year where the American Legion returned our check for a booth at this year's 100th centennial of the American Legion, uh, returning our check and telling us we were not welcome. Uh, because of that experience, Ernie Gallo, our president, said he didn't want to do anything about it, but if any of the other members would be interested, they could do so. Well, s somehow through email, I came in contact with Michelle, and she asked me if I'd be willing to go to the convention. I said, I really can't afford it. She said, if I raise you the money, will you go? And I said, yeah, I'll go. I uh, took the effort to contact the Department of Missouri leadership for the American Legion. I called Jefferson City and I got a hold of our department adjutant, a uh, lady by the name of Lori Finley Jackson, delightful African-American lady. And I asked her if I could send her some information. She said, sure. So I mailed her a copy of the John Crutzen article that was published on the front page of the Chicago Tribune several years ago, New Revelations in Attack on American Spy Ship. I also included a copy of my picture that was taken the next morning of the day after the attack with my face all burned. I signed it personally to Lori Finley Jackson, and I signed it a soul brother to a soul sister. She called me on the phone and said, I can't promise you anything, but if you'll come to Reno, I will try to get you delegate status for the convention. So I flew to Reno. I'm wearing my Purple Heart uniform. Um, I had my badge on with my name, Department of Missouri, Military Order of the Purple Heart. A uh, business suit with my miniature medals, Silver Star and Purple Heart on. Marine Corps medal and my Purple Heart cap. This tall husky gentleman came over and shook my hand and thanked me for my service. I handed him a copy of my card and he handed me a copy of his card. Well, his card said White House Communications Agency. I thought, might be a good idea to remember this one. Um, the, the, the convention, I tried to go to this meeting and that meeting and ask some questions around. And I became acquainted with a gentleman who was a member of the National uh, Executive Committee of the American Legion. And he told me he would try to help me get the resolution through. We had talked rather extensively. Uh, he had been in the Seabees in during the Vietnam era, actually the same time I was there as a lieutenant commander, he was leading a CB team and knew many of the areas where I'd been stationed in Vietnam, so we had a very pleasant conversation. I uh, went back to my hotel room that night, and uh, I had introduced myself. I was allowed to introduce myself at the uh, 
preliminaries for the committee meeting of the National Executive Committee. And I told them who I was, told them what we were there for, for this resolution, and that it was, we really wanted Congress to investigate the attack on our ship, which is required by the Constitution. I go back to my hotel room that evening, and I have an email from this gentleman that I had met, who was a member of the, of the executive committee, told me, he said, uh, I have discussed it with the leadership. They are opposed to the resolution. Sorry. So I'm thinking, that's over with. I just well go home. I'm sitting in a hotel room, and my cell phone room rings, and it's Michelle Kanukin. I told her what had transpired, and I was going to go ahead and head home. She literally shamed me into staying for the convention. I thought, well, what am I going to do? Well, I'll try and do what I can. Um, on the way back to the hotel, I had met a gentleman by the name of Kerry Kellett, who was, I, I just happened to sit down next to him on the bus, taking us back to the hotel. Kerry was a Department of Missouri commander for the American Legion. We visited a few moments on the bus back, and he said, let's go to Starbucks and get something to drink, drink and we'll talk about it. So we went back to Starbucks and I bought a couple of Cokes and he said, what you need to do is you need to go to the uh, National Security Committee meeting Sunday morning. Let them know what you were there for and ask them if you can have a, a moment to speak. You will have to go to the Foreign Affairs Subcommittee meeting, do the same thing there, ask for a brief moment to speak. So early Sunday morning, I got the bus, went over to the convention center, and went into the room which was scheduled for the National Security Committee meeting. There's a long table with several places for members. There was one gentleman standing there, went over and introduced myself, and his name was uh, Bill Schley. He was the chairman for the... National Security Committee. Um, I told him what I was there for, handed him my business card, handed him a copy of my picture that was taken the next morning. And his eyes got big as saucers, and he said, would you let me have another one of your cards? And I did so, and he said, I will give this to a, a Bill uh, Flanagan, who is the chair for the Foreign Affairs Subcommittee meeting. He said, you'll have to go into the committee meeting, ask him to briefly speak if he'll let you do that, and state your position. So I did so. I, I got in there, and um, Mr. Flanagan already knew who I was. Um, he probably spent at least five minutes telling me I only had three minutes to state our position. He read the resolution, stated the Legion leadership recommends a rejection of this motion. We believe that passing this resolution would lead to fringe groups using it to try to reshape American foreign policy in the Middle East. I had a speech prepared. I said, this is not about anti-Semitism. This is not about being anti-Jewish. This is about a foreign country who has deliberately attacked a United States ship on the high seas, in violation of international law, and has made an attempt to cover it up as a case of mistaken identity. The only thing we want is for Congress to do their duty to fully and fairly investigate the attack, and sat down. Um, the chairman said, what will you do with this resolution? A gentleman by the name of Roger Norfolk, who was the delegate from the state of Iowa, immediately jumped to his feet and said, I make the motion, the resolution be accepted. And there were about three voice seconds made. There was a delegate there from the state of Washington. I don't remember his last name, and his first name was Bill. He jumped to his feet and he said, I make the motion, the resolution be withdrawn. Well, this puts the chair in an awkward position. There's already a motion on the floor, approved and seconded. He said, your motion is out of order. We must vote 
on this resolution first. Is there any discussion? I don't recall there being any discussion, but he called for a voice vote. It was pretty obvious that it passed with voice vote. Someone said, I demand a show of hands. Show of hands was called for. There were 27 hands in favor of passing the resolution. There were 11 opposed to it. Motion has carried. This delegate from Washington jumps up and says, I make the motion, the resolution be withdrawn. I'm sorry, you are out of order. The resolution has passed. It must go to the full committee. Uh, we were given a break, went to the full committee. I'm sitting there and I hear someone behind me whisper, said, it's that guy up there. It's got the purple heart hat on. I was oddball, I must admit, among all these American legionnaires. But the chairman, uh, Mr. Schley brought up, Michael Schley brought up the motion, read the, read the resolution, and asked, what is your pleasure? And someone immediately jumped to their feet, said, I make the motion, the resolution be accepted. There were several seconds. The same delegate from the state of Washington jumps up and says, I make the motion, the resolution be withdrawn. Well, there was a legal representative there, a young gentleman, uh, went over and whispered in Chairman Mike Schley's ear. I have no idea what he said. But he said, we have a motion on the floor which has been made and seconded. We must act on the motion. What is your pleasure? Is there any discussion? I don't recall there being any discussion. But he said, we must vote on the resolution. It was overwhelming voice, voice vote in favor of the resolution. Over and done. Now it has to go to the full floor. On Monday morning, I believe it was, during the full convention, the resolution came up and was overwhelmingly approved by voice vote. Um, the next morning, everything is over with. Early in the morning, I go to get on the shuttle bus and head to the airport for the trip back. There were two flight crews that were getting on the same shuttle bus. One of the officers reached over and shook my hand and thanked me for my service, so I gave him my card. Come to find out, he had been in the Marines, was a forward naval gunfire observer, and uh, became a pilot with uh, this American Airlines subsidiary. Um, we get out to the airport, and I go to get on the plane. I hand my pass to the stewardess, and she said, Mr. Lockwood, the captain would like to see you. I thought, what have I done wrong? I uh, went up to the cockpit, and the captain introduced himself and said, uh, I, I forgot the gentleman's name now, but he said he told me about your experience aboard the USS Liberty. He said, I'm sorry, we would like to get you a first-class seat, but the plane is booked full. There are no first-class seats available. I said, that's fine. Took my seat, flew to Dallas, Dallas International Airport, got to change planes, get on this larger plane for my flight to Springfield, Missouri, and I'm going through the first class section. Uh, since I had to change my departure time, they put me way in the back of the plane by the baggage compartment. I'm going through first class section, I hear this voice, hey, Bryce, I thought, Dallas International Airport, who knows me here? It happened to be the same gentleman that handed me his card earlier, White House Communications Agency. Luckily, I remembered his name, called us, hey, how are you doing? Went back to my seat, flew into Springfield. It's pretty early in the morning, get off the plane. My wife greets me, and I'm standing there at the luggage area waiting for my luggage to come up. I feel a tap on my shoulder. I turn around, and here's the same gentleman for the White House Communications Agency. We visited briefly, and I said, where are you staying? He said, uh, Holiday Inn. I said, which one? He said, it's, uh, North Glenstone Avenue. I said, oh, hey, that's great. So maybe we can get together while we're here. Uh, the next morning, my wife wanted to go into town with a dear friend of ours and do some shopping, so I gave her a little package with uh, Liberty USS Liberty Challenge coin. The front part of it has the USS Liberty seal, and the back part, a picture of the ship that was all shot up the next morning. Around the circumference of the medal are the names of all 34 who were killed. 
along with a copy of a picture that was autographed to him and a copy of the Crutzen article and put it in an envelope and asked my wife to drop it off at the motel and mark it for this gentleman. Um, a few hours later, I get a text on my cell phone thanking me. So I texted him back and I said, have you got some time off while you're here? He texted me back, yes. I said, would you like a home-cooked meal? He texted me back, yes. I said, uh, would venison burgers, hot dogs, and corn on the grill be okay? He texted me back, yes. I said, come on out to the farm. So we had a nice cookout and had a nice meal together, and he's, uh, he's quite a cut-up. My wife put a bag on the floor to put all the husks from the grilled corn in, and he says, oh, I don't need that. He said, he told me to throw it on the floor. <laughs> He's eating his corn on the cob, and he said, I can't promise you anything, but would you be interested in seeing Air Force One come in? Well, duh. Sure I would. He said, I'll try to see what I can do. Um, sometime later that afternoon, I get a text from this lady. Uh, she was the White House press... Um, coordination, I forgot her exact title, but she said, if you will go to the airport, gave me the time to be there, I will text you your pass. Well, we were told there were only a total of 150 that were given invitations to attend for the president's arrival. Um, we were told that there would be no water available. It was a hot day, late August. No water available, no place to sit down. You'll be in a roped off area. You would just have to stand there and wait. I get out to the airport. I was in the back side of the airport, and there are all this heavy equipment lined out there so it, nothing can get through. I get to Air Force One. I uh, dropped my wife off there. I said, No purses. So I told her, I said, Lock your purse up in the trunk, put it in the trunk. I dropped her off, and I started to go to the parking area, which is about a quarter of a mile away. and I hear someone shout my name. I look up in the rearview mirror, and here's a secret service agent coming after me. I thought, oh, God, I must have blown something. He said, uh, Mr. Lockwood, I have this envelope for you. He said, it may be a rather long afternoon. He said, you might want to just keep it in your car. I went and parked and started back, and uh, there was this crowd of people that was waiting to go through uh, secret service uh, examination and um, I happened to see the lieutenant governor pretty well back in the line we had had a Purple Heart ceremony for Miller County Missouri a couple months previous to that in Tuscumbia Missouri the county seat and uh, this gentleman's name was uh, uh, oh gosh just slipped my mind currently the governor but I did remember his, his name at the time, and I went over and shook hands with him and said, good to see you again. And Secret Service agent took my wife and me right to the head of the line. I had given this gentleman from the White House Communications Agency a copy of Mr. Ennis's book, Salt on the Liberty, and apparently he had read it in the hotel room. Uh, they wanted us, examined all of our stuff, and one of the agents said, Come with us. They took us to an area where they did service work for the vehicles there that service the aircraft. They had a seating area there for us. They had seats for both my wife and me. Would you like some cold water? We'll get you some cold water. While we're sitting there waiting for Air Force One to come in, these Secret Service agents were coming over and shaking hands with us and calling us by name. One of them was a Navy commander in full uniform. His name was Rick Lawler. I found out later that I think in February, the president had presented the Medal of Honor to a, a person from the Afghanistan war. Commander Lawler was the one who was reading the citation as the president was hanging the medal around his neck. I was pretty impressed with that. Um, we were taken to an area to wait as the plane landed and uh, the president's staff was deplaning. 
Um, we were taken to an area right next to the press corps. They were on a large trailer that was all roped off. And I would have thought if there's a fellow in a suit with his wife is all by himself out there, I wonder what he's there for. It seems to me if I was a member of the press corps, I'd want to know and ask some questions. Nobody said a word. Um, they ran the stairs up to the, the plane. Uh, we were escorted over there. There were a total of eight of us in the line. The governor, lieutenant governor, two couples that I didn't know. I found out later one of those couples was a Cook family from the Cook Industries in Springfield, Missouri. They had given a quarter of a million dollars to the president's re-election campaign. So, of course, he was there to have a campaign tour of the... Is that like the Cook brothers? Like Cook brothers? Or is that a different No, this family? is... The, the Cook. They produce... Uh, industrial air handling equipment and uh, <clears throat> quite wealthy people. And my wife and I were the last ones in line. <coughs> so after um, 50 years of not getting any... Not getting any? You're about to talk to the President... President of the United States. States. Commander-in-Chief, buck stops there. Uh, I had told one of the Secret Service offices that I had wanted to present a Liberty Challenge coin to the President. He said, oh, that's all right. I said, well, when he shakes hands with me, it will be in my hand. He said, okay, we got it. Um, he came down the steps and went through the receiving line. Um, I saluted him. He reached over to shake hands with me, and Commander Lawler said, this is Bryce Lockwood and his wife Lois. He is the only Marine survivor of the Israeli attack on the USS Liberty. The American Legion Convention just passed a resolution, number 40, calling upon the 117th Congress to pass a resolution calling for the full and fair investigation into the attack on the USS Liberty. The president nodded to me, shook hands with me. Uh, when I did so, he felt that coin in his hand. He had a surprised look on his face. The president has a habit of doing the Donald Trump handshake jerky to him. Well, when he felt that coin in his hand, he didn't do that. Uh, I, I must say his, his daughter, Ivanka, is a very personable lady. Uh, she introduced herself to my wife, shook hands with her, did her amenities with the other dignitaries that were there and came back around again and shook hands a second time with my wife and had some small talk with her. I was very much impressed with uh, Ivanka Trump. So to summarize the story, when you were in Las Vegas at the convention, a couple of days in, you had kind of said, okay, it's not going to happen. You've already encountered resistance at that point. Michelle Knudsen inspires you to say, hey, hang out, see what happens. She shamed me into it. Right? <laughs> hey, if it's effective, right? Um, uh, I should interject here. Um, in, the, in the lobby of the convention center, a gentleman came over to me by the name of Jack Nalen. Jack Nalen had been the uh, department commander for the state of New Hampshire, and he had attempted several years earlier to pass a resolution and did so through the Department of New Hampshire. At the convention that year, the national judge advocate, Philip Onderdunk, went to him and said, you cannot introduce that resolution. Well, excuse me, it has already passed the department. It has to be considered. But he said, oh, you can't do that. Well, Mr. Lehman just assumed he knew what he was doing and didn't carry it forward. He came to me in the lobby and thanked me, and he said, I'm sorry that we didn't get that done. He said, well, now it's a matter of record. It's done. So after you get Resolution 40 passed in Reno, Nevada, it then is supposed to go to the Congress. What kind of new opposition or expanded opposition did you encounter once it had a larger stage? I wouldn't say there's any opposition. I'd just say it was uh, ig ignore it. I understand there's a lot been going through Congress. Uh, foreign relations that have to be taken care of, a budget that has to be taken care of, something to do about the national health program and so. Congress hadn't exactly been sitting on their hands, but excuse me, many years ago, the 
Veterans of Foreign Wars passed a resolution on the Liberty attack. Now the American Legion has passed a resolution on the Liberty attack. What are you going to do about it, Congress? How have the Veterans of Foreign Wars and the American Legion supported these efforts? Um, I believe every year the Veterans of Foreign Wars has, uh, again, passed that same resolution. Uh, I have been to some of those conventions. My wife and I have had a USS Liberty booth at those conventions every year since 2009. The experience with the American Legion is something new. Um, I believe I mentioned earlier in the interview that we had received a letter from the American Legion telling us that we were not welcome or returning our check. I contacted uh, uh, the department adjutant, Lori Finley Jackson, again this year and told her that I would like to be a delegate again to the convention. She sent me the forms that were necessary. I filled the forms out. Um, mailed the two checks. One check was for uh, the registration fee and check for the hospitality fee and a separate check for the housing fee. And uh, they have cashed both of my checks. So I am assuming that I am in again this year as a delegate to the American Legion Convention. In spite of the fact that they have turned us down with a booth. I believe we'll discuss that with some of the department leadership before we get there. That sounds like a tactic of discouragement, not welcoming, you know, yes. your perspective. Exactly. Saying it contradicts with their agenda. Uh, I have a copy of that letter in my phone. I'll show that to you. Since you've met with President Trump on the tarmac, has there been any progress toward a new congressional inquiry? I'm sorry, not a new one, a congressional inquiry into the events of that day? No. Uh, just as my personal belief from my experience earlier with uh, Senator, then Congressman Roy Blunt, that this is what is going to happen. Congress is going to just ignore it. They'll answer the letters, yes, we're looking into it, and then never do anything. So it was a sacrifice to preserve a, a, a relationship of foreign policy. Pretty much that. Presently, we're in the 2018 midterm election, and with so many candidates running for election in U.S. Congress, um, in all 435 congressional districts across the nation, are there any public events in this country where prospective voters can educate themselves about the historicity of the town hall meetings would be the place to do that. People that are friendly to our cause go to the town hall meetings and confront the candidates and let them know that we have these resolutions passed by America's two largest federal organizations. What are you going to do about it? Does the American Legion or the USS Liberty Veterans Association have a plan in place for its members and supporters to get out during this election season and publicly reference and educate? As far as I know, neither the Veterans of Foreign Wars, nor the American Legion, nor the USS Liberty Veterans Association have any kind of a formal plan to pursue the investigation by the United States Congress. So without those investigations being undertaken officially by the United States Congress, it's more of ad hoc activism trying to spread this message until you can get the attention of the right people for the right reasons that'll shine a spotlight and do the investigation. That is exactly it. But the problem is those of us who are survivors are getting up in years. And it, it's my personal belief that the powers that be, both in the United States and in Israel, who are both very friendly towards each other, hope that we just fade away off the scene and forget about the whole thing. If such an organized plan of action is not currently in place, would you encourage such a national effort of local events to coordinate the information of, you know, informing of the public of these events? I would encourage it, yes, but excuse me, I'm retired, living on fixed income, and it's a severe drain on my budget just going around the country giving lectures from time to time on the attack ownership. Pulling back to the overall lessons that you've drawn mostly from the aftermath and how you've seen things mishandled on purpose and an investigation to this day still not taking place. 
what can people do to help resolve this deterioration of freedom that, that we're experiencing in this country and continues to kind of escalate because it's all built on the body of lies of these you know, historical events that aren't based on history? My advice to all Americans would be before you go to the polls, number one, register to vote. Number two, go to the polls and vote. But before you go to the polls and vote, do your homework. Find out exactly what these candidates believe, not just the sound bites that they give you over a 30 second or a 10 second spot on television or radio. Find out what they really believe, and then when you go and vote, do right. Do you think the, the types and ways and formats of financing our political candidates has anything to do with the deleterious State I think freedom. we should go to a national system where money is provided in the budget, nothing more, for candidates to get their word out. No more of this multi-million dollar secret giving, hide under the table. That, that has got to come to a stop. This is just throughout our entire electoral system. Not just the Congress, the Senate. The Supreme Court, our judges, federal judges, there is big money involved in twisting arms to get the will done of the people who are pulling the strings that have the money behind the scenes. And I would give you, uh, for instance, my Senator Roy Blunt stuck a paragraph in the Farm Bill that was just very recently passed, absolving Monsanto Chemical Company from claims for uh, cancer due to Roundup and some other chemicals that they're using, which have been proven to cause cancer and is starting to turn up in our food supply, both in corn and wheat and soybeans. This is unconscionable. But excuse me, Senator Blunt is on a receipt from a million dollar figure from the Monsanto Chemical Company for his reelection campaign. So conflicts of interest cause this absence of integrity, and then you find a country in the state we're in today, where 51 what years What the hell later, is integrity when you got money involved? If you could be heard by everyone on the planet 50 years from now, if you had a message to the future, what would you tell those people who are your great-grandchildren, these, these people in the future who live trying to sort out all of these... Um, national security secrets that have been passed along as our history. What would you tell the future? What's your message? To thine own self be true if I could steal one from William Shakespeare. Why is it important that people know about it? We should not allow our government to get away with murder, and that's exactly what has happened in the case of the attack on the USS Liberty. 34 American lives lost. 270 other American lives screwed up for the rest of their lives because of the horrors that they went through and the terrible way that our government has told us to sit down and shut up and don't talk about it. What precedent does that set in relation to our foreign policy relationship with Israel? George Washington, in his farewell address to the nation, warned us about getting in foreign entanglements with other governments. We've never paid attention to that. We've gotten cozy with Great Britain. We've gotten cozy with France. We've gotten very, very cozy with Israel. In uh, 1986, I, I've got a grain hauling business running up and down the highway. I've got time to do anything but book loads and get them in there and keep the equipment operating. And my phone rings. This inter gentleman introduced himself. He said, you don't know me, but my name is Trevor Pinnock. I work for Thames Television, London, England. I'm calling you from London, England. He was a producer of the BBC film, Dead in the Water. Trevor Pinnock told me in that conversation he had been to Israel and was interviewing Ariel Sharon, who at the time of the attack was the head of the Israeli government. He said to him, Mr. Sharon, what do you think American Congress is going to say when they find out about this? This is a quote from the head of a foreign government. Congress, 
Forget Congress. We own Congress. I am not anti-Semitic and I'm not anti-Jewish. Um, I addressed a group in St. Paul, Minnesota just a few weeks ago. There, was a, there were actually four groups that sponsored my being there. And one of those groups was um, Jews for Peace. There was another group there, um, Committee for Justice in the Middle East. It was representative there. And the uh, a Veterans for Peace organization. And I had lunch with Jewish people that want to see justice done in the Middle East. Here's a government who has taken land from a people who have been there for 2,000 years by military force. And it was <clears throat> the, the opinion of the Jewish people who were there was that overall, approximately half of the Jewish people in Israel don't like what their government is doing to the Palestinian people. There's a lot of people in America that don't like what our government does to you know certain groups around the world. There's people in every country. So I never think that the historical event should be tagged to a bunch of people in a country when really it's the state apparatus of those countries. And none of us in any of these countries have much control, if any, of those state apparatus. Don't have much voice. Yeah, right. You think in this case, Justice had the blindfold off and was treating some... Peeking out from underneath with one eye open. Okay. That's the opposite of what Justice is... Neil Gorsuch. Be. Here is just newly confirmed as seat on the Supreme Court. We have a clause in the Constitution about emoluments. What does Neil Gorsuch do? Within 30 days of being sworn in, he's giving three speeches to large corporations with a speaking fee of six figures each. Is that fair? Is that unbiased? Is that peeking out from underneath justice blindfold? It doesn't sound like fair representation. And that's how our government's based, right? It's supposed to be representative of the people's will. The people give the constitutional power to these agencies and these branches, right? That's where it goes. The approval of the people leads to the Constitution, which gives our government the right to do all the government things that they do, right? Allegedly. It appears to me that our government is doing whatever they want to, to stay in power. So it's disconnected from the rules in the Constitution, which is what we you're go pointing through, out. We go through the motions of a free election, but is it really? What part of the Constitution specifies that the USS Liberty's type of attack must be investigated by Congress? Article 1, Section 8. I usually carry a copy around with me, but I clean my pockets out to give my suit to the cleaners and forgot to put it back in. <laughs> can you give us the cliff note version? I can give you a quick note version, yes, uh, of, among duties of Congress to investigate acts of piracy and felonies against the laws of nation on the high seas. I believe that's pretty close. If you were the president, if you were the president, what would you do right now to bring this to resolution? Go before Congress and tell them to do their duty and I'd probably get assassinated. What would be the backup plan for that then? Was well, there another way that a president could lead an investigation of this and not end up? I know of no other way. And excuse me, the president we have right now is packing his staff with people that are friendly to Israel. Bryce, if I had to ask you a question, what would you say to people who want to join the military apparatus? What do they need to know before they put their lives on the line? I'm a, I'm a, a kid just out of high school. I'm 18 years old, 19 years old. I have no pro job prospects. According to Ray McGovern, it's a jobs program and nothing more right now, because that's the choice that our, our young citizens are given as an option for life. It's that's like a problems. soft soft draft. Like, right. Backdoor draft. Backdoor draft, yes. And excuse me, they lure education and health care for life, and yeah, that's all very good and beautiful, but excuse me, how about 
the way that we are intervening in foreign governments, sticking our nose in their business. And what happens when you get hurt? What would my advice be for kids just getting out of high school today? <clears throat> Go to college. There are ways you can get your college education paid for. Avoid the military. You don't know what you're going to get involved in. And it's probably going to be something that will be very painful, both to you and to your family. Go to college. Get your education. Make yourself useful to the community and to the future of our country. Sergeant Lockwood, I would like to thank you for your service and for making it visible to other people.